Hello, everybody. I'm Sarah Proto, and I've come from Space with Videos for Your Face. This is the final version of my iceberg video. I based this off of an iceberg video I found on Twitter by Northzilla, but I've added just as much of my own entries which will make for this to be a truly massive iceberg. I previously released this as a multi-parter, but good news, or bad depending on your viewpoint, this director's cut has even more entries than all of the individual parts. So if you saw the other ones, there's still, there's still more new stuff in this one too. I've added new stuff to every tier. This iceberg took months of work to make, write, edit, research, and record, and I do it all myself. I don't have an editor or any of that. So if you like this video, please make sure you like it and share it wherever you can. The goal of this iceberg was to be a sort of primer on these topics so that you could go back into YouTube armed with new content to search up and get more details on. If you do search for more, you should definitely check out LabRat, Lagovert, and Wang. A lot of these topics I used in this video. I use their videos for additional research. So those are great places to go to to get the full details. But if you want me to cover any of these in a video of their own, let me know in the comments below. I'll be glad to do so. If you're unfamiliar with an iceberg, first, welcome to YouTube. Second, it's like a tier list, but we start at the peak of the iceberg, the most commonly known knowledge, then we work our way down, going deeper with the knowledge, and sometimes darker. As we get closer and closer to the bottom, we'll be getting into darker subjects like sexual content, people unaliving themselves, or unaliving others. Keep in mind, this is furry stuff, so this may be weirder than what you would typically consider your weirdest. So if this stuff makes you uncomfortable, maybe skip on this one and check out my original species playlist. And those videos are much safer to watch. Anyway, let's get started, and don't forget to stick around until the end when I read and respond to a comment from each of the individual layers all at the end. Layer 0, Gateway Fandoms. This is normal stuff. This layer is mostly fandoms that are furry adjacent, like a gateway drug, where if you like one of these, you have a 50-50 chance of becoming a furry. Basically, you like these innocently until you one day Google with the safe search filter off. Pokemon being the most obvious one. No doubt you run into furries with Pokesonas, which are fursonas that are Pokemon themed. If you're new to furry stuff, a fursona is like an original character that you make that is supposed to be a self insert of you within the furry fandom. It represents you as a sort of avatar or a persona that is a stand in for you in the fandom. There are Pokemon fans who have fursonas that are based on Pokemon and they are called Pokesonas. Basically, anyone with a Lucario profile picture. These sonas are usually intelligent, like most humanoids, and aren't just animals. But the Pokemon fandom is a good gateway into the fandom because of roleplay groups and a lot of fan content. Also, if you're not an internet infant, you've probably been exposed to Pokemon Prawn in some sort of way. Star Fox is a game from Nintendo that features talking animals engaging in space battles. Star Fox is classic furry bait, and especially so in NSFW circles, where pretty much every character has been sexualized. Before we had Luna and Roxanne Wolf, we had Crystal and Renamon as the most sexualized characters in the fandom, but this one is a gateway because funny talking animal, and Nintendo fans tend to be exceptionally rabid and passionate about their fanships. Balto is a movie franchise about talking sled dogs and one wolf who becomes a sled dog and delivers penicillin to save of dying girl. It's furry bait because as a kid a lot of us probably saw this cartoon and pretended to be dogs afterwards. Then went online and discovered Balto OCs or Sparkle Dogs and that kickstarted the downward spiral that led us into the fandom. It's not usually strong enough to turn someone into a furry on its own, but it's a video that gets people curious in some of the stronger stuff. I'm talking about furry like it's a drug, when it's more like a disease. The Fantastic Mr. Fox. I actually haven't seen this movie, but it's a stop motion animated movie based on the Roald Dahl book, which I have read and don't remember because I was practically a fetus when I read it. It of course has a cast of humanoid animals that talk and has a pretty stellar cast like Meryl Streep, Owen Wilson, and George Clooney. This is potent stuff honestly, every few years there's a piece of media that converts and makes new furries and I think this was one of the big ones. The others on this tier are like Zootopia and Robin Hood who came out during like separate generations and converted an entire generation of an entire new generation of furries. Digimon, like Pokemon, this has people who make Digimon personas. I have a few friends that talk about pretty much nothing but Digimon. I personally like this series a lot as a kid and I got the Digivice toys but I fell off until Cyber Sleuth came out. I think this was exceptionally strong furry content because we had Digimon that were not for the kids watching. Like Daddy, I'm, I mean Leomon, Leomon, but come on. 
he, he, daddy. And a Digimon named Lilithmon, Lady Debimon, and Angelomon. Not to mention Renamon, who is initially genderless, but ended up getting hypersexualized by the fandom, and pretty much every representation of them in the fandom from that point onwards was very feminine. Like Crystal, Renamon is synonymous with the idea of furry rule 34. You've definitely stumbled onto some lewd Renamon art by accident, and or intentionally, I'm not here to judge. The Lion King is a Disney movie about talking lions. Everyone knows about this movie, but I know people who haven't seen Disney's Robin Hood, so The Lion King might be forgotten soon too. Lots of people are into Lion King, and as usual with Disney, it's their fault so many furries exist. Simba is shown as being handsome, kind, and flirtatious with Nala, which gives some people some feels for him. Then two came out and Kovu walked in stage and people saw this damaged little emo lion with a dark past and wept. <laughs> I, can, I can fix him. Even Curtis Connor has a thing for Kovu. Proud of this one, but I also raise you this. Okay. Dude, when I first saw Kovu in Lion King 2 Simba's Pride, I lost my mind, man. I wanted to be him so bad. I'm not lying, okay? But I wish I was. I wish I was that specific lion. Timon and Pumbaa were originally planned to just be friends, but instead come across more as a gay couple, considering they raised a son together, and Timon is voiced by Nathan Lane, a gay man. This series spawned a lot of fan groups, role plays, fan fictions, and were the inspiration for a lot of adopts and many parts of furry culture, even though it was like one of many furry gateway films, rather than being the inciting one for a lot of people. One of the inspired pieces of work based off of Lion King was Impressive Title. It's a gateway game that's still a very obscure one. I'm including it in this tier because of its relation to Lion King and it was usually the next step people took after Lion King into discovering the world of furry stuff. Most furries don't know about it, but it's actually a 3D MMO where you roleplayed as lions. Hey, sorry to interrupt your program, but real quick, we got a sponsor for this video. It's Bubblegum Bark. Bubblegum Bark is a 3D model brand owned by Beetle Yeen on Twitter. They make a variety of different 3D models designed for use in VR chat. They recently released an angel sheep and a demon goat model that I just had to get. And thankfully, Bubblegum Bark sent me a copy, but I'm incredibly bad with Blender, so it might be a while before you see the model in any videos. But you should check their models out. You can buy them on Gumroad, or you can try them on for free in VR chat before you buy them. They also have a Discord that is very friendly and helpful. They tried their best to help me, but let's be real, I'm over 30. You're lucky I know how to use YouTube. Check out BGB's card link in the description. It's the first link. Now back to the video. Five Nights at Freddy's. This one is still fresh, but yes, furry robots, I want to hunt you down and stuff you into animatronic suits. We have Superstar Freddy, and I want him to call me Superstar. And Roxanne tickles you in 360 view videos on YouTube. Ooh, Roxanne toes. No, it's gone. <laughs> gimme, there, gimme, please. toesy toesies, mommy. There, Roxanne is definitely a character people turn their safe search filter off for. I know Chica was pretty big at one time too, but you'll learn in the fandom, Girl Wolf is the biggest thirst trap for the fandom. Even characters of other species who are more sexualized in their source material still get passed up for characters like Luna and Roxy. Robin Hood, this is the one that got me interested in furry media. I watched it when I was eight and I tried to find more games and movies starring animals like that. That's when I found the word anthropomorphic, then furry, and it's all history. I don't know what part stuck out to me most. Seeing it as an adult, none of the characters are particularly attractive or appealing to me. They're all just eh. La Fontaine and Aesop Fables are a series of folk tales. Many of these fables written starred animals who talked and have been adapted and changed a lot over the years. MLP, or My Little Pony, is a furry adjacent community based around a TV series about talking horses, unicorns, and pegasi. You probably know what this is, but this is a gateway into the brony fandom or the MLP fandom at large that then becomes a gateway into the furry fandom. Zootopia is a Disney movie you've probably seen. It's about two criminals, Nick Wilde who runs scams, and Judy Hopps who works for the police force, and they work together to discover a big scandal. The whole movie has this B-plot about racism and xenophobia, but that whole point falls really flat when you start thinking about how the ones being mistreated are predators, which pose a real and legitimate threat to prey species, whereas the victims of real-world injustices aren't a threat to anyone. Anyway, this is a Gen Z furry maker. We have yet to see what the long-term effects of this film will have on the fandom, and the people who join it from watching it. I'm adding Earth Eternal here because it's an awesome browser-based MMORPG with custom furry characters that I have played. I played a blue jay who was a mage. Unfortunately, the game is dead, 
and big sad. Original species here is in the gateway section despite usually being found by most furries in the deeper levels. Original species are creatures that people make up. Later I talk about protogens and dutch angel dragons who are furry specific ones, but many original species aren't even furry. I just kind of lump them all in there because no one will argue it. Sonic the Hedgehog is about a blue hedgehog who runs fast from a video game of the same name. He fights Dr. Eggman and he has cartoons and movies about him. The obvious conversion factor here is talking animal but like mlp this character has an entire subculture and fandom of its own that is adjacent to being a furry there are tons of sonic fan characters out there so many that you can google your name plus the word the hedgehog and you will find several ocs with names just like yours Unlike bronies though, they didn't resist becoming furries at all and quickly became another facet of the fandom. Bronies did too, but it took them a little while before they accepted it. Oh, I forgot one. Homestucks. Homestuck is an online Flash web series, comic, and game starring characters called trolls. Like Sonic, MLP, and Pokesonas, Homestuck fans made their own troll characters and would roleplay and go to cons dressed like them. You're probably familiar with how furries get a bad name because of some of the bad behavior at cons, but Homestucks were just as bad. For a lot of Homestucks, this was their first time being in a fandom and going to cons, and many were young so they didn't know how to behave in these situations. Once Homestuck started winding down, many left for other fandoms that had similar focuses on community, art, and conventions. Some last minute additions I forgot. I'm never going to finish this series just because I keep finding and remembering more stuff to add in. Animal Crossing is a game by Nintendo where you live in a small town and rent from a tanuki who you pay back via doing odd jobs like fishing and bug catching. While playing the game, you meet a wide variety of other animals you get to see every day and hang out with. Eventually, you may develop a crush on the characters in the games. Characters like Nook, Isabel, and Akka, who have all been looted extensively on the net, so even if you weren't looking for this kind of stuff, you probably at least bumped into either NSFW of the three I mentioned, or are at least aware of Honka Zone. This can lead down to a rabbit hole for someone searching these characters. Even if it stays SFW, they'll find other people's personas that are drawn in the Animal Crossing style and become aware of the fandom in that way. Neopets and other online pet sims. Neopets is an online pet simulation game where you take care of and play mini games with your pet to get money and rewards. If you play Neopets, you might have played the video games, which star furries, or you went on to other pet sims like Moshi Monsters and eventually got into role playing and original species. Layer Zero Editions. Furry Cringe Comps. This might seem like a silly one to add to the Gateway Fandom section, but you'd be surprised how many non furries. Tell me they thought we were all weirdos because of cringe comps, then subbed to me or some other furries, and a couple months later, they're a furry too now. Uh, I've heard this three times, and I've only been making content on this channel for six months, so I feel like that's a lot of people in a short amount of time. But the first step is always awareness. Once everyone starts knowing what furries are, then we're going to start seeing more furries, and there's no such thing as bad advertisement. Although, we're really pushing it with some people. <sighs> really pushing it. Playboy bunnies is something that appeals to furry tastes in the lightest possible sense and is considered a normal interest for non-furries that is still furry adjacent. Those who don't know because Playboy is a relic of printed media, Playboy is a company that started with Hugh Hefner. These dirty mags go all the way back to 1953 and the original starred Marilyn Monroe. Many of the magazines later on starred other celebrities and other models on the cover. But specifically, the Marilyn one, Hefner didn't pay her to pose. He just bought a nude photo of her and published it, which nowadays is incredibly scummy. Anyway, he had the bright idea to put naked women in magazines and sell them to dudes. Hugh's empire grew and eventually led to the creation of the Playboy Clubs. The logo for the Playboy company was a bunny in a tuxedo, so they based the waitress's outfit off of the logo. A one-piece swimsuit corset style lingerie with bow ties, little bunny tails, and bunny ears. Some dudes might become obsessed with these outfits, and what starts as an innocent little turn-on becomes a really big obsession when exposed to characters like Lola Bunny, and it blossoms into the furry virus. Werewolves. Honestly, 
You could also put this down a few tiers on the Berg, and it'd fit in just as well due to it being a deep obsession for some, and it's crossover with Omegaverse fanfiction. Werewolves are one of those things someone might think a furry is or compare them to in order to help normal people understand them better. It's also one of those things that are pretty ingrained in the fandom that someone wouldn't realize is a furry thing until you say so and they're like, oh my god, how did I not see that? It's so obvious. Omegaverse, also known as ABO, stands for Alpha, Beta, and Omega. It's a genre of fanfiction set in a universe where the characters have a social and sexual structure very similar to Kanid's. For the full details, check out my video about ABO in the description. It's called Omegaverse, or what is the Omegaverse. It's pretty interesting stuff, and once you get the full context, you probably won't even consider this a gateway interest so much as being hand-in-hand -hand with furries the way MLP is. The short of it is that these characters typically retain their appearances and behaviors from their origin media, but with the twist that they'll be an alpha, beta, or omega. These three archetypes are essentially treated as sexes slash genders. Uh, the alpha will typically be the aggressor, which is also a personality type. Uh, female alphas will typically have, uh, they can have, what's, what's the, why, what's the clean, what's the friendly YouTube way to say this? Uh, female alphas will typically either have a vagu or a not vagu, and the females are able to impregnate omega males, which have a vagu. But that's just a little taste of it, so you should go see the whole video because I go into extreme detail and cover a, quite a bit of it. Enough to disturb you, I feel like. So yeah, uh, here's a clip of me explaining the differences. And then after you see this, I'm sure you're going to want to see the whole thing. In the Omegaverse are male and female, but each have three subsexes. Omega males and alpha females can have entirely different sexual organs. Alpha males are your typical alphas when thinking of pseudoscientific wolf social hierarchy. Their alphas are dominant, aggressive, and horny. Alpha males have a penis and a butt, and no other sexual organs. Beta males are just normal dudes and have a mix of alpha and omega traits and usually have a penis and a butt like alphas. They're your normal type of people. They're your quote-unquote normies. Alright, sounds perfectly normal so far. Omega males are submissive, breedable, calm, gentle, Oh, whoops, not breedable. I typed breadable here. Omega males are submissive, breadable, calm, <laughs> gentle, and nice. As you can see, there is a lot of overlap here on the male side with yaoi fiction. They have a penis as one typically does, lacking testes, as they don't reproduce the way beta and alphas do. They have no need for their testes. But they do have a uterus that connects to their anal cavity that has a cloacal flap. You're welcome to click off now if you want, because it doesn't get better. Anal sex can result in the impregnation of omega males, and birth is done through the cloacal flap and out of the anus. Since the ass functions as both for birth and defecation, this would mean that omega males have a cloaca in addition to a penis. This idea is for the birds. Get it? Do you get it? Cause, cause birds have cloacas and for the birds? Yeah, okay. Anyway. Anyway. Alpha, Beta, and Omega women all follow the same social hierarchy as the uh, Alpha, Beta, and Omega males do, but Omega women are like cis women. They have a uterus, a vagina, and a butt. Beta women are also like that, but present Beta traits, which is, as we discussed, a alpha mix of Alpha and Omega traits. And Alpha women can have a penis and a uterus. It's closer to how girl hyenas are. Their penis is an enlarged clitoris, which is great news for guys, so, because you should have a much easier time finding it now. But this isn't entirely factual, as Omegaverse is more of a general guide than a list of laws. The, uh, the peni and the presentation of how the peni is formed in, uh, alpha females is, is, up, is subjective. It's up to the writer. They can be depicted with a penis and testes, but no vagina, or they can have a vagina with an enlarged clitoris and ovaries that serve a sort of dual function of producing semen and eggs. That isn't the extent of it, though. To match their newfound animalia genitalia, <laughs> they have reproductive cycles similar to... I'm laughing at my own joke. 
uh, Warrior Cats. This was supposed to be on the first layer, and people reminded me of it. And I included it in the roleplay section, but I forgot to mention what it was in the first one. It's a uh, it's a gateway fandom. It's a series of books about cats that are sentient and go to wars and fight with each other and there's politics and stuff like that that they deal with all the characters have these like really striking names like uh nightshade night river nightfall nightfire night hunter shadow skin shadow lady <laughs> shadow rose shadow child shadow bird shadow storm night storm night bird fallen shadow nightwing oh jesus Here's some for white cats, lily pad, lily heart, lily moon, white shadow, white claw, white knight, white moon, white rose, white leap, white horn, snowfall, ice wind, frostbite, frost pool, snow song. Here's some for brown cats, thorn prick, cobra strike, snake skin, viper fang, adder snap, bramble song, bramble prick, briar song, thorn wing, fallen snake, snake bite. You got a it plays into the furry fandom really well because if you're into warrior cats, you probably roleplayed with other people online as your own character that you made up. And there's, uh, you can make your own warrior cat character and give them names and stuff like that. And people did that and yeah, so it's got a lot in common with the furry fandom without actually being a part of the furry fandom directly. It's another one of those adjacent fandoms that get you accidentally into being a furry. VTubers. Here's a shark girl. And here's a shark girl. Any questions? Seriously though, a pretty sizable amount of VTubers are part animal to some extent, typically having animal ears and a tail like Nanners, being a straight up furry like me and Buff Pup, or just being themed off of an animal like Gargara. You find one of us cute, then you might one day start dipping into the furry stuff. Undertale. This fandom has a lot of staples that the furry fandom does, and that's likely because a lot of furries are already in this fandom. You have fanfics, shipping, an artistic and obsessive community, and then all you need to do is search Toriel with the safe search filter off, and you're done. R.I.P. homie. VR Chat is an online social multiplayer online game where players go into various worlds, talk, hang out, and screw around. Despite what its name suggests, you don't actually need a VR headset to participate in VR chat. It's free, and there are lots of custom avatars in the game, and you can upload your own or buy from other people. Lots of furries play this because they can upload furry models or buy them and hang out with other furries. It's like digital fursuiting. VR chat isn't the first game to do this though. Second Life used to do this too, but required a lot of add-ons to be fully enjoyed, and the creators who make the models make less because of transfer fees and the company taking a tax on all transactions on the platform. Meanwhile, for VR chat, most people just upload their stuff to Gumroad, and Gumroad just takes a little bit off the top. Layer 1. Common Furry Knowledge This is still surface level stuff, but the stuff here you at least know what a furry is already. The Odd Ones Out is an animation YouTuber. The creator of the channel, James, claims he isn't a furry, but admitted to going to a furry convention dressed up in his fursuit. Normally I'm of the mindset that you can appreciate furry, their art, their content, and their media without being one, but James owns a fursuit, which even just a head alone is like a thousand dollars. That's a pretty big purchase for someone who isn't into the hobby, just saying. There's more evidence to suggest that he is a furry though. He dressed up in a video and made a fursuit ASMR video that has since been privated. Sounds like someone has a secret past they're not too proud of. Also, in one of his videos, you can see a bookmarked Fur Affinity page. I didn't get Fur Affinity until just three years ago. Again, this is a site that even furries hate using because it's a dated site. So you have to be pretty furry to use it. Anthropomorphism is another word for furry. It's applying human characteristics to animals. Things like making them as intelligent as humans, being bipedal, or having personalities and behaviors akin to humans. Think Cat in the Hat, Zootopia, or Robin Hood. The difference between this and furry is that furry means the fandom and the works made within it. Dance competitions. Pretty much every furry convention has one of these. Some fursuiters are really great at dancing, even when being weighed down by 30 pounds of fur and foam. Beastars refers to an anime that stars a cast of kimono characters. Kimono is Japanese for furry. Kimono has its own spot, so I'll talk more about it there. But Beastars involves furry characters living in a boarding school. It follows a male wolf named Legacy, who is involved in a drama club. It starts with a character discovered being killed, and people suspect it was a predator who did it. 
Lego Seed later meets his love interest, who is a rabbit, and he struggles with the dynamic of being in love with her, or whether he wants to eat her. This might also be talking about the sexual tension between Lego C and the deer character. I haven't seen it myself, but my wife Mabel explained it to me. Basically, it goes into some pretty adult themes like sexuality and murder. It's like Zootopia for grown-ups, I guess. Protogens are species in the fandom. They're open and anyone can be one if they follow some design rules. They're known for being fluffy, partially organic, and synthetic, and having a visor that displays their face and emotions. You've probably seen one before and not known what it was. And if you want to know more about furry fandom species, you happen to be at the right channel already. You can learn more about them from my in-depth species videos about them. Link in the description for the protogen one. Egyptian gods are furries. I feel like this could have been in the gateway layer, but most of the Egyptian gods like Anubis are anthropomorphic. I assume it means that and not how they're often looted too. Telephone is next, but Dutch Angel Dragons are on this layer too, so I'll cover them both now. Dutch Angel Dragons are an open, furry fandom species that anyone can make a character of if they follow some of the rules. I have a video going over them, but there's a ton of info the owner Eno, also known as Telephone, has made. So I'm doing it in parts. You can find part 1 in the description, but things of note are that the species doesn't have a digestive tract or genitalia, so they can't poop or have adult fun times. They reproduce by the partners rebirthing like a phoenix at the same time. Telephone is the character made by Eno, and the species is designed around a pet horse that Eno had. Telephone is different from the other dragons because in the lore there is a war and Dutch Angel Dragon sinned, but Telephone didn't. Also, Telephone is super important. She's like a Jesus-like character and has some culty overtones. Check out the video in the description. I go over it in there. Telephone is also a first suitor who has a rabid fan base that drools over the character because the suitor is actually a really good actor. Yif is a sin. It is the worst word in the fandom. It's code for furry art and furries engaging in adult behaviors. If I remember right, the word comes from the sound a fox makes during mating. The word is cringe even by furry standards, and most use the word ironically now. The fandom is pretty open when it comes to human sexuality now, so as we became more open about this stuff, the word yif got used less and less. This isn't on here, but it's in the same category as yif, so I'm adding mate as well. Mate is a furry word meaning girlfriend, boyfriend, partner, husband, wife, etc. It's not gendered, and it's also a cringe-inducing term that's fallen out of use. I cringe a bit when I hear it, but it's not as bad as yif. Pawing. It's a word for self-yif, and is the worst word of all. Even worse than yif. Even saying it, I want to go and take a shower now. Oh whoa, well, and by extension, oh well, are furry emotes that predate emojis. They are the faces one makes when feeling these moods. A oh, woe is usually meant to mean surprise, whereas uwu is being shy and cutesy. While both are still used, they're used ironically due to them being the subject of a joke frequently. I've been a furry for about 15-ish years, and I've never heard someone use either of these in earnest. A oh, woe is commonly used in conjunction with what's this and nuzzles your bulgy wulgy. The joke here is that, oh whoa, well, what's this, is expressing surprise and seeing a large bulge, and you know the rest. It's a copy pasta, and there are voice acting memes referring to it too. Die. Extra noses pounces on you, ooh, you're so warm. Ooh. Couldn't help but notice your bulge from across the floor. Noses your Nikki like you told them or till they hee hee. Unzips your baggiest pants, oh baby, you so musky. Take me home, pet me, and make me yours, and don't forget to stuff me. See me like my little baby tail for your bulgy bulgy. Sargles are sort of furry fandom species. They're actually related to the fictional universe by Mick Ono. The universe is massive and features many races beyond just Sargles even greatly details their culture and history. I haven't covered this species because it would be massive, and if I did cover it, it'd have to be my magnum opus, because I don't think a bigger video could be made. Sergals are denoted by their shark-like appearance, long tails, and cheese wedge-shaped head. This head shape is the source of a lot of jokes made at their expense, and the source of a lot of memes. In the lore, Sergals are pansexual, where attractiveness matters more than gender or race. Polyamorous, where they have multiple partners, and female circles are the, usually the initiator for relationships. The genders are also indistinguishable from each other, and this has resulted in some drama. Specifically, one character in the lore called Rain Sills, who was a general, is a sexual deviant, and this character was liked by a lot of people. This character also led to the stereotyping of the species as also being deviants. The wiki likes to make it clear that Rain is an extreme and not a rule. Also, this is going to get TMI, 
but the female circles downstairs hookup is very different from standard and isn't too dissimilar from a female hyena except it's a prehensile tentacle instead. So Google at your own risk, but having a unique hookup probably also led to their extreme sexualization. Agretsuko or Aggressive Retsuko is a Sanrio anime starring a cute red panda woman living her life in a capitalist society that is always overbearing, crushing, and suffocating her, but she unwinds by going to karaoke bars and singing metal. It follows her daily life in a 9 to 5 working at a desk with a boss who doesn't respect her, harasses her, and makes her life just genuinely miserable. He's a misogynistic pig who is also literally a pig, as well as the other pressures she has with being a woman in her culture. She also has multiple relationships across the series. She dates a millionaire anti-capitalist donkey, like literal donkey, that's not me. <laughs> that's that's not me joking or using it as an insult. It's not it's not me going full Gordon Ramsay. Donkey, you absolute donkey. No, he's seriously an anti-capitalist donkey, who's also a millionaire. Uh, she also has a secret admirer who is a hyena and dates a boring as hell red panda. If Zootopia is for kids, this is kind of an adult version of that without like the sexual overtones of like B stars. It's uh it's more adult in the sense of it's relatable. It's like experiences you might actually have yourself. The hyena is also voiced by Benjamin Diskin, who likes furries and is quoted as saying, I like seeing the cute stuff, seeing Retsuko and Haida going on dates, but anything more than that, like what goes on behind, like what goes on behind closed doors, I just don't want to see it. Furry Amino is a subset of Amino, which is a social media app. It works as a community manager and is used by lots of groups. It's a forum, a site host, and more. The furry one is kept as a separate app and the furry one is mostly populated by underage furries and art thieves. Most of the participants in the Amino don't engage much with the fandom at large because furries outside of Amino isn't really the most welcoming place to kids. Majira Strawberry, uh, he's an absolutely massive uh, furry count. I think he's the biggest furry content creator, specifically furry content creator. There's bigger furry YouTubers like uh, Pyrocynical, but he doesn't make furry content. So, Majira is like the biggest furry content creator. And Like Telephone is a very popular fursuiter and furry YouTuber. They're also a poppy fur. Dun 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 dun. Which I'll go over next. Majira makes furry content in a fursuit. I don't personally watch furry content, it's not something that really interests me. Some say I should try to be more interested in it though because I VTube and that a VTuber model is just a digital fursuit and I'm here like. What's, I, I don't VTube, what are you talking about? Poppy fur I don't see on the iceberg, so I'll add it here myself. A poppy fur is a term meaning a popular furry. Someone who is so popular in furry spaces that they are likely known outside of furry spaces too. People like Majira, Telephone, Beta Eta Delota, and Pyrocynical. It's also used as a derogatory term that people throw around at anyone who has a bigger following than the person using the word. They're most likely using the word because the poppy fur in question doesn't like them, refuses to engage with them, or because the individual calling them a poppy fur doesn't like them for some reason or another. It's one of those words that gets thrown around so much that it doesn't have a meaning anymore. I mean, I've even been called a poppy fur, and I would say I am not. I'll add Beta and Pyrocynical here too. Beta is a furry YouTuber who makes various kinds of contents, but it's mostly reacting to Reddit's memes and React content. People on the internet were kind of mad with them for a little while because Beta said that most furry content sucks. I agree, kind of. I feel like furry content isn't as varied as it could be, and yeah. That's also coming from someone who's a furry content creator, but yeah. Beta also said this before I started YouTube, so they haven't seen that I've completely revolutionized the game and I'm making big humongous waves here and you know, they just don't they just don't know it yet. The the, the furry fandom's about to be a big see a big change and it's me. Not really. I'm kind of just the same as everyone else. Channels like Beta's and Majira's are in a weird spot. They have a lot of subs, but they're starting to reach the limits of their growth because they're trapped in furry content. There's a lot of furries, but it's still a small niche. But for a furry YouTube to hit big numbers, they're going to have to, at one point, step away from fandom-specific content. Which brings me to Pyrocynical. Pyrocynical is another furry YouTuber, but he doesn't make furry content. He's also a fat fur. I'm not judging my wives are fat furs. Pyro does a variety of content, but none of it is furry related, which is why he's in the millions of subs and not the hundreds of thousands of subs. I like his gaming videos and his movie reviews. Furfinity is a furry art hosting site. 
It's a bit dated, being almost as old as the fandom, and has gone through updates to try and modernize it. I personally don't like using it, it's too similar to DeviantArt, but it's also the most used furry site, so you can find a lot of musicians, artists, writers, and more there. But due to some stuff in the past, they made it so that you had to make an account to view a lot of its content. I'll go over that later because uh, it's, some, it's some deeper Berg stuff. BNA is an anime called Brand New Animal. It's made by Studio Trigger, who has made some of the best anime on this planet, like Kill a Kill, Darling of the Franks, and Little Witch Academia. BNA is basically a furry paradise. It's set in a future where humans live alongside a new species of human called Beastmen, who could turn into humanoid animals because of a unique DNA trait. But these people, as is common for Earth, are treated badly because of their differences. It centers around a girl who can turn into a tanuki, which is a raccoon dog, to save her best friend. After discovering this about herself, she runs away to a city for beastmen. I haven't seen it myself, so I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but you can get the gist here that it's about the persecution of those who are different and involves transhumanism themes. Scalies, avians, and non-mammalian anthros. These are anthropomorphic creatures that aren't animals like foxes, wolves, and cats. The artistic community has done an amazing job of making creatures that aren't typically anthro, and adapting them in a very furry way. At one point, shark furries didn't exist, and if you asked me 10 years ago to imagine a shark furry, I wouldn't even really be able to conceive what that would look like. Scalies are reptilians or dragons, avians are birds, and non-mammalian covers everything else like kangaroos and sharks. Layer 2 this is the part of the iceberg that is just below the surface, the wider part that we can't easily see. It might not be that deep, but this is the part that took out the Titanic. Gray muscles. This refers to furries in their 40s and onwards. It means old people. The gray is referring to the gray hairs people grow with age and the graying of a wolf's muzzle as it ages. Recently, some people have been referring to themselves as gray muscles that I've seen on like Twitter, and these are people that are in my age group that are th 30, and it's like, cool if you want to be that old, if you want to consider yourself ancient already. I'm not quite ready yet. The 20k Furry Commission. You discovered protogens and duchies in the previous tier, and now you might be interested in other original species. The Grem cores look cool, so you search them on YouTube, maybe to see if your favorite furry YouTuber, who specializes in species content, and see if they made a video on them yet. I haven't yet because I'm holding out for that Izzy's collab, that'll never happen. Anyway, you'll find an Izzy's video on Grim talking about the 20k furry commission. This was a Grim custom commission that was auctioned off which led into a massive bidding war that ended up at around the $20,000 mark. The bidder later realized how absurd that what they just did was and requested that they get their money back. They were going through a rough time. The artist turned down the refund, so the bidder demanded it get done sooner rather than later. The final art piece isn't the best thing ever, but could honestly someone really draw a piece of furry art of just one character that would truly be worth that price tag? That's up to you. VR conventions are furry cons that became popular during the Big Sick from a couple years ago. They're usually hosted on VR chat where Rather than wearing fursuits, people show up in furry avatars. It's a little more inclusive because more people have gaming PCs than fursuits, and models only cost like $50 and below. So most people likely all have models that they've edited as well. It's also super inclusive because you can be from anywhere in the world and visit. And if you're too anxious to go outside, then you can still enjoy a furcon digitally. I wonder if I could get a panel at one of these. E621.net is a media hosting site for furry art and pornography. There isn't any hard rules for what can't be uploaded here, so everything good and everything bad that your little mind can think of can be found here. Things from just normal vanilla prawn to hardcore scrub your hard drive prawn. You can comment on posts and there are many, many tags you can search going as specific as the hair color or eye color. If you have a favorite furry prawn artist, you can search their name and see all the stuff that's been uploaded, and fans can even upload the stuff themselves too. Roleplay is pretending to be a character and engaging in storytelling with another person. Typically with furries, one person will pretend to be their character and engage in a story with other people, usually on a forum or in private messages. Lots of groups do this, like Warrior Cats fans, Sonic fans, but I assume since we're talking about E6 at this layer, they probably mean erotic roleplay, where two people roleplay adult acts with one another and they engage and, and indulge in each other's... Can I say kinks on YouTube? 
I guess we'll find out. 80% LGBT plus refers to a survey. Yeah. <laughs> Why did I say that like chills for a second? Number 15. Burger King foot lettuce. 80% LGBT plus refers to a survey from Fur Science that polled Anthrocon attendees about their identity based on sexuality. But 80% identified as lesbian, gay, bi, pan, ace, something else, or they don't know. So only 20% of the attendees were confirmed straight. In summer 2020, this number went down to only 10% straight. Again, this is just numbers from a convention, and not representative of the entire fandom. As far as we know, but a lot of people, yeah. Let's just say yeah. I saw a survey of r slash furry, and it was 40% straight. I think the more important takeaway here is the extended section of the survey. Most furries believe that sexualities other than their own are going to be less accepting of them. But the numbers here actually show the opposite. Most of us are LGBT. The actual acceptance rate was double of what people who believed others would hate them for their identity was. So maybe some of you should open up a little bit more and maybe trust each other. Sonic Fox is a furry gaming professional. He's won lots of tournaments at EVO in fighting games like Mortal Kombat and Skullgirls. He also received an award for Gamer of the Year at the Gaming Awards, which he accepted his trophy in fursuit. All, all the, the single, single furries, furries, all the single furries, all the single furries, is a cover of the song All the Single Ladies, with many of the lyrics being replaced with furry themes, all of which was performed in fursuit. It's backed with this awful droning sound and really farty tones, it's torture, and it's legally recognized as a form of torture in many countries, and goes against the Geneva Convention. It's been used by denizens of the net to see how long you can watch before you have to click off. My first time was 45 seconds. I finished it today, but I definitely hated all of it. If you liked it, then you should have to put a leash on it, but they never tell you what to do if you hate it. All the single furries, all the single furries, now put your paws up. I'm just a pup pup, don't know how to stop, stop shaking my own little tail. Decided to wag, I had to beg, beg. you didn't even notice me. I'm down here, here. you're up there, there, don't pay me any attention. I fold my ears, ears. and face my fears, ears. you think you are too good for me. Cause if you liked it, then you should have put a leash on it. If you liked it, then you should have put a leash on it. Don't be mad once you see that they want it. Anti-furries aren't really new to anyone, there are tons of casual furry haters out there. But I'm talking about people who full-time it, who treat it like it's a job. People who send death threats to furries, or the anti-furry coalition who adopts Nazi propaganda, imagery, and symbolism in order to encourage the genocide of furries. Which I'm sure totally helps their case and doesn't make them look like irredeemable pieces of racist and ignorant garbage. As we are. The three camps of anti-furries fall into the Nazi wannabes, gullible children, and YouTubers who like to have an easy punching bag. For the Nazi wannabes, that's easy. This is a group that tells on itself. In their move to look and be as edgy as possible, they actually push away anyone with any bit of sense. Furries are a primarily queer community, and these anti-furries are running around using Nazi iconography. I'll never understand the kind of person who looks at stuff like Nazi iconography, who looks at their flags and looks at what the Nazis have done and think, wow, those guys are cool. Those guys are the good guys. Like, what kind of, like, I can just not understand the kind of person who has that kind of thought process. Like, are you just stupid or like, you have to be being edgy on purpose because like, how is anybody supposed to look at y'all doing stuff like this, sporting Nazi iconography, and think that you're supposed to be the good guys? How can, how Furry Councilman is Scott Chamberlain, who resigned after being ousted as a furry. There's even a picture of him next to Cooper Tom, who is in a very cursed photo that we will be discussing far down on the list. Kimono is a Japanese genre of media that is essentially furries. One of the more popular kimono genres is a subgenre of bara called Kimono Bara, starring cute, chubby, and buff furry guys dating. Kimono is a bit more distinct from Western furry art, though the art style is much closer to anime, which is its origin. Kimono stylings are also applied to fursuits, and they're starting to catch on here. They also have the anime law of big eye, small mouth. Tony the Tiger is probably referring to how furries drove Tony the Tiger off of Twitter. There is an internet historian video about it, but I can't remember if it was furries who were genuinely into daddy's toned physique, 
or just an elaborate joke. Either way, people were harassing Tony and being very graphic with who we can assume was probably either some 30-year-old social media manager or an underpaid intern. Regardless, no one should be harassed this way at work. Eventually, Tony started blocking any commenters with furry profile pics. This resulted in boycotts and drama, and really could have just been avoided if people didn't have to be so weird and creepy. Bad Dragon is a company that makes a variety of toys designed to fulfill furry desires. The toys are primarily for insertion, but there are toys designed to receive it as well. They are shaped like uh, intimate parts. If you're curious, feel free to Google it. I just can't go into details about it here. Furries vs Gamers was a TikTok war. I wasn't on TikTok at the time this was happening, so I had to do a bit of research for this one. It was a TikTok sort of war. Looks like it was all in good fun. Just a bunch of furries and gamers duetting with each other to make content. There's some cringe stuff here and there, but it's not so bad. I thought this was going to be way worse. It was mostly TikToks of furries and gamers committing various war crimes and engaging in tactics and warfare with each other. The weebs were there as well, but were neutral at the time and could only stand by and watch the bloodshed. Lone Digger is a music video by Caravan Palace. Caravan Palace makes great music, but this one was a real banger. Electro swing against a backdrop of furries enjoying a strip club and cats and dogs fighting in a very bloody fight. Super recommend it. Great music, cool visuals, and it was talked about for months in furry circles after its release. House Pets is a webcomic that's been going on since 2008. I haven't read all that much of it myself, but think Sunday newspaper comics that are actually funny with furries in it. It's cute and has a very distinct art style. Beauty of the Base is a furry DJ and fursuit designer that wears a fursuit that has a functioning speaker built into it. They're easily recognizable by their demented and striking appearance, and this demented theming goes across many of the suits they design. A uh, cool thing about the speaker is that the owner has tested the battery for the speaker, and it lasts so long that they actually haven't experienced it going out yet. They said that they were able to wear the speaker and suit for five hours before the speaker just being constantly on started to, you know, mess with them. So, that battery, I don't know, maybe maybe share the designs or something like that? So, uh, so we can, uh, I don't know, so I can stop buying so many double A's for my Wii remotes? CSI episode refers to an episode of CSI about furries called Fur and Loathing. It's been critically received by furries for a lot of reasons, mostly due to inaccuracies, the lack of research, low-key homophobia, and the sexual focus in the show. I've seen it, and it was... Definitely written by a bunch of boomers who have never met a gay person, let alone a furry. There was a scene in which a fursuiter was wearing lingerie and danced on a catwalk with a stripper pole at the end. After confronting the cat fursuiter, they round up all the blue cat fursuiters and one says, This is racial profiling. Yikes. The one in lingerie is also revealed to be male under the suit and identifies as female while fursuiting. I want to say this is an attempt at transphobia considering media's history with portraying trans people as criminals and as women of the night, but homophobia works here too if Miss Kitty here is just a drag queen. Furry turns you gay. The furry fandom is a community full of queer people and people notice this. So it's believed by some outside people, outside of the fandom, that being a furry turns you gay. In actuality, the fandom attracts gay people because it's an openly queer community that allows queer people to be themselves with people who will accept you for who they are. A group that understands being alienated or ostracized and wouldn't want to do that to someone else for being gay. It's like acceptance makes people okay with being themselves and lets people leave their closets. <laughs> Imagine that. Fursuits... Uh, sorry. Mersuits are fursuits made for adult activities. There are two kinds of furries, the kind that spend four grand on their fursuit and would never dare soil it with dirt, let alone someone else's bodily fluids. And the kind that spent 4k just to do that. Adults, closed doors, all that, not judging. r slash hell is a subreddit dedicated to sharing furries engaging in behavior that is lacking self-awareness. Basically, they post pictures that they say are cringy and people laugh at it. Maws versus paws. Maws means mouth, and paws are paws. People usually ask this as a question. It's basically asking which trait you find more appealing. There is no right way to answer it. You just can't answer this question, right? You're either admitting that you like feet or you like vor. I think they only paired these two together because of it rhyming. Uh, but the real answer is maws, but not because of vor, but just because I want to give them a smooch. <sighs> Of course this is on the iceberg. It, it has to it has to be on the iceberg. It has to be on every iceberg. It has to be on every furry iceberg. We can't be allowed to forget this, I guess. Rainforest 2015 is a furry convention. Due to many managerial failures, this convention turned into an anarchic wasteland. It was like playing Rust on a primitive server. 
Shortly after starting, a picture circulated of a con goer wearing a soiled diaper. There were also instances of vandalism, hospitalizations, and many called the cops. The behavior of attendance was so bad that the hotel got upset with the convention, and the con said that they'd do it elsewhere next year. Next year never happened because the hotel called all the others and warned them about rain first. The lesson here is, is that we can't have a fun, rules-free space, because rules-free to some people means shame-free. A con is still a public space. If you want to do it in public, why would you do it at a con? But because of this event, many people think all furries are like the ones present at Rainforest, rather than comparing against other larger fur cons that have never had this issue. PCD is post-con depression, a debilitating and life-threatening illness that affects millions of furries every year. For some people, these huge conventions are the only time people can meet with their online friends in person or long-distance partners, and for others, it's the only place they can be their true LGBT selves. Going home for the latter means going back in the closet. Cons are just fun too, so they get back and it means going back to your normal day-to-day -day and day-to-day -day blows. Ferals are quadrupedal animals with human intelligence. The term feral is used to refer to alternate forms for people's sonas that are actual animal versions of their sonas. Some get NSFW of this form, and the community is split on whether they consider this zoo behavior or not. For some, they consider it okay because they pass the Harkness test, meaning they have the intelligence to consent and are old enough to, meaning they are not an animal, they are on par with humans for the sake of intelligence. For example, a Krogan from Mass Effect would pass the Harkness test. They're not human, but they aren't actual wizards, and are intelligent enough to say, yeah, we'll bang. Report to the ship as soon as possible. We'll bang, okay? Others say it's zoo because it's too close to real animals. Pokesonas get wrapped up in this for similar reasons. I understand both camps, but it's too close to real animals for me, but I think we should focus our efforts on real admitted zoophiles and zoo status in the fandom. Uncle Cage is a furry celebrity. He's an Anthrocon chairman. He's also known for being an excellent auctioneer storyteller and is also a chemist. He's also friends with two griffins, an alleged comedian. Two has a long controversial history of saying what is effectively, what if bad thing good actually? Like when he said Nazis only killed people because people hated Nazis, which is wrong at the least. He also said more people died in pools than in hate crime, so we should be more concerned about pools. I wrote this, and I still have a hard time... <laughs> I still have a hard time reading that. Okay, yeah, he said more people died in pools than in hate crimes, so we should be more <laughs> concerned about pools. Which is an absolutely juvenile dumb take. He's also quoted with saying he'd rather hang out with Nazis than someone who calls him out for mansplaining. Uh, I could keep going, because there's plenty, but, uh, let's, let's continue. Uncle Cage, we're all friends with at least one idiot, but I don't see two on this berg, so I added them. Although, if your friend is talking about Nazi beliefs and pushing them, maybe you should stop being friends with them. Another addition that ties into Uncle Cage is his banning of a couple from attending fur cons because they talked about fursuit sex on the Tyra Banks show. I'm adding this here because it's actually pretty nutty. They talked about fur affinity, and this resulted in a lot of viewers checking the site out. So many people checked it out over the course of a week that it caused a DDoS effect where the site was inaccessible because too many people were trying to use it. The Fandom Documentary is a documentary film about the furry fandom that discusses the history of it, and you don't need me to talk about it because you can watch it for free on YouTube. One more quick thing, this actually got announced on the same day that I'm working on editing the video. So, Ash Coyote, the creator of the fandom documentary, just put out a Kickstarter for a sequel to the fandom, and they're looking to get funding to make a sequel. So, make sure after this video you go out and check the fandom documentary on YouTube, it's free, and then also check out their Kickstarter. Fake Chinese fursuits. I watched a couple videos on these recently on stream. One was the Snake Busters video about Violent Jay's kid. They bought a fursuit off of eBay or something and received a cheap, badly made fursuit that, if I remember right, didn't even have any fur on it. It was made out of tracksuit materials or something like that. Also, there's a bonus for you. Jay from Insane Clown Posse's kid is a fursuiter, and they went to a convention together and both fursuited. Furry drama. Where to begin? This is such a big and long-standing genre of content. There are your light dramas, of people's interpersonal arguments and big stuff that shouldn't be called drama, but still is. I used to be a moderator for a furry social media site, so I have a lot of experience with minor dramas. Some examples of stuff I've encountered is some gay furries who hate women, and frequently talk about how they find women disgusting. Some furries who are racist. 
pseudo-intellectuals whose whole life philosophy is to be a contrarian at every opportunity and gives us such amazing witticisms of what if bad thing good actually. Transphobia coming from people who claim to be LGBT friendly and a lot of transphobia coming from people that had they just asked for more info could have unlearned their biases but it's easier to say something stupid instead. Just a lot of drama coming from a lot of willful ignorance and naivete. Then there's the juicy stuff. The stuff that makes for content. Stuff like Kira the Wolf, who was discovered to be a zoo sadist and a zoo necrophile, which was a shock because he was a big YouTuber in the fandom. Hypnotist Sappho, who was a big furry YouTuber who made VR chat content, who openly admitted to being a zoophile on YouTube and was later discovered to also be a pedo. BLFC Deluxe Pizza, where Maid Wolfie and 20 other dudes made a pizza with extra white sauce and left it in the hallway at the hotel before being kicked out for a biohazard, because bodily fluids are a biohazard, or the time it, or the time he and 34 dudes nutted into a bong that he then smoked. So, drama in the furry fandom, pretty loosely defined. Minor disagreements would be best described as drama, and serious things like what Kiro and Hypno did, which are crimes, are just called dramas when they should actually be taken very seriously. Coming out as a furry refers to the belief that some furries have that they think they need to come out as a furry as one might come out as gay or trans to their family. Furry is a community, or a hobby, or a kink. It's not a sexuality. While we might get made fun of, harassed, or sometimes assaulted for being a furry, it's not quite on the scale of how a sexual minority would be treated, like no one is systematically oppressing furries. The idea you need to come out as a furry comes from the community being primarily LGBT. So many of us talk about our experience with coming out as gay and trans, and eventually the wires must have gotten crossed somewhere, and some must have thought that they needed to come out as a furry too. Now a lot of people seem to think that they need to as well. Coming out as a furry is just so funny and weird to me. Like, do you come out to your parents for liking video games? Or liking anime? Mom? Dad? I like Gundam. I hope this doesn't change the way you think of me. The not. Alright YouTube, I'm using purely clinical terms to say this, which means it falls under education. Skip ahead if you don't want to hear me talking about animal mating behaviors and body parts. The knot is a bulbous lump at the base of the shaft of a canid's junk. The knot is used in mating. Once nut is achieved, the male will force his knot into the vaguber until it pops in. They'll then leave the knot in until they go softer than me when someone says yif unironically. This is to ensure that the female is fully inseminated to give the best chance of knocking them up. This knot has been incorporated into furry NSFW because it's an added little challenge on top of the full length itself. This is practically a necessity for some prawn NSFW artists, but I don't see anyone complain about knotless dongs as long as they're thicker than a forearm. So, I guess, you know, all's fair in love and dongs. Shark girls are definitely in the top five for the most attractive personas, and a lot of furries agree since there are reddits dedicated specifically to sharing shark girl art and boobs, as well as shark dudes. They're cute, shiny, smooth, and they're almost always in bathing suits because they're sharks, they like to swim, which I think probably just added to it a little bit, a little fan service, you know. Uh, they also look soft, but are paired with angular shapes and scary rows of shark teeth. The ocean's greatest predator, and a big fear for some people, turned into a babe. I think the attraction here is a mix of what I said in terms of the description, but also the danger. You know, a fear boner. The same way some furries feel about werewolves. There's pictures of cats on the screen now. You got 30 seconds to click off before I start getting into the darker subjects. Okay, you good? Layer 3. Oh heck yeah, it is getting very weird now. This is where it gets good, and by good, I mean- Oh god, no, please. 
I'm ash so ashamed that I know what these are. Uh, Nyx is gonna hang out with me because she's not feeling like leaving the room. Okay. Well, actually, I think you're a little young to hear me talking about these subjects, Nyx, so I'm gonna have to ask you to leave. Fox in the Stable is a 3D animated furry 10 minute long furry prawn video where a little fox guy gets absolutely railed by a 10 foot tall horse dude. The fox's mouth is almost always agape like he's in constant shock and awe, and the video has major uncanny valley vibes with, mo with monotonous low energy electronic music. The fur detail is way too much, the creator poured their entire existence into making this. And this was about, this was created about 10 years before we started seeing a lot of like 3D animations being made with like Blender and Source and stuff like that. So this person really went hard to make these videos. And yeah, it's also all voice acted, including the gritty sound effects. And like I said, this was from a long while back before 3D stuff was very common, but you haven't lived until you have to tell your wife that you're watching prawn for research. This is relatively tame if you've seen anything else furry prawn related. Let's just leave it at that fox is going to be walking a little funny for a while. Inflation is a kink involving filling a character with a liquid or gas in order to make them grow out like a balloon. Vor used to be the big furry joke at one point, but ever since uh, someone named Diesel Raccoon deflected political talk with inflates you big and round, the community hasn't been the same since. Inflation can be done with anything, air, bike pumps, Arizona tea, and more. Tickling is a kink where furries are strapped down or restricted in some way and tickled until they can't stand it anymore. The art is almost always accompanied by disturbingly detailed feet. Sexy airplanes are images of airplanes that are humanized. They're furry adjacent content, but they're anthroplanes a few have been Drawn by the artist Fivel on Twitter, who does a lot of content like this, including the Tide Pod Furry and recently the, uh, the Lego Brick Crocodile. Kiro the Wolf. When we get into these individuals, that's when this is going to start getting a lot longer. There's a lot of individual people within the, uh, in, within the fandom that is mentioned in these icebergs, and that's when I'm going to try and get all the details that I can covered. Yeah, these ones about specific people are going to get pretty long. Kiro the Wolf is a YouTuber who was busted for loving dogs a little too much, and dead things too. There was photographic and video evidence of him harming his dog and a dead fox he found on the side of the road. Kiro claims the cops and FBI checked his drives and couldn't find anything. In actuality, the videos and images fell outside the statute of limitations, meaning that they couldn't legally be used against him. But in his video returning to the fandom, he says they just couldn't find anything which is a lie. They found stuff, they just couldn't use that stuff. He also claimed someone else sent him those, and that his account was hacked, the logs were faked. He said a lot of stuff. Cothrix, who we will discuss soon, claimed to discuss these matters directly to Kiro, where Kiro admitted it. Kiro denied that, but again was met with chat logs from Cothrix. Cothrix is another layer down, so you'll have to wait, but mm, there's a lot there too. Kiro also claimed that he joined a telegram group for feral artwork and never specified whether that was SFW or not. And while feral might not be used for zoophilic fantasies, we have to assume that in the case of someone who has just been accused of zoophilia, they are probably using it for that fantasy fulfillment. Also, the person who put the logs out there is a zoophile himself, and Kiro claims that because of that, the source can't be trusted. But if anything, to me, it makes him look guiltier. The person who snitched on him was a zoophile who didn't believe in hurting animals, and saw, through Kira's pics, that he was a zoo sadist and reveled in the harm he caused to animals. Even though both kinds are still harming animals, yeah, both zoophilia and zoo sadism is harming animals, Kiro has long been since condemned and disavowed by furries all over. Miles DF 5K YCH. A YCH is an image that is sketched out as a template for one or multiple characters. So you sell one of the slots and draw them the image. Usually these YCHs are intended to be sold to a lot of people with edits for each different character. Miles DF is a furry artist who is very popular for their loot art. The YCH they sold before this was $2,600 and the newer one was $5,000, so uh, two times leap. Although this is a bit of old news as they are selling even more expensive ones now. Yes, expensive, and it's up to the individuals to decide whether it's worth it. But dang, wish I could get that much, I'm sitting here collecting ad revenue change. Anyway. 
sub to my Patreon or buy ad space in one of my videos to help out my channel. I also have a Patreon where the NSFW art I own is posted, and while you can't own it, it's only 3 bucks a month to see it. TLDR of it. People got upset, made memes, moved on. As one does. The more interesting news is that they made an NFT that sold for $400,000 and no one really talked about that. Howler is a furry dating app designed to emulate the gay dating app Grinder. It uses your location to find nearby furries who you can play Legos with. The controversy around this one is the founder, Stormy, is a zoo. How did they find out? Well, he has a Zeta symbol in his Twitter profile. For those who don't know, this symbol means zoo file. The app's dev account is still registered to Stormy's name despite Stormy allegedly stepping down. Duke Doberman is a furry YouTuber who really pushes the limits of what YouTube allows. Duke Doberman makes thirst trap videos and softcore prawn on YouTube. The most shocking thing to me here is that he only has 7k subs. I thought a daddy like him would have so many more subs, like subs lining up out the door. Subscribers out the wazoo. Wait, what kind of subs did you think I was talking about? Furry Network is a multimedia hosting site like for Affinity. It's I'm searching hard to see if I'm missing something. This is just like an art site like FA, right? I don't see anything weird. I see that they banned Cub Art, which is art of adolescent furries, which as a private business they have the right to. Zavivaka video is referencing the Russian FIFA mascot Zavivaka, a furry dog. That I said furry dog was probably enough to make you guess that R34 was made of him. The video starts talking about how cute and innocent Zavi is. Aw, what a cute character. He looks so happy and carefree. Don't do it, don't do- Oh no. Zabivaka! The narrator then starts crying over the mountains and mountains of prawn Zabi has been drawn in. Ah, oh, you just wanted to play with your balls! And they drew you playing with your balls! Ah, oh, Zabivaka! Are you people proud? Are you people proud of yourselves? You made rushes for Sona cry! You made rushes... <laughs> oh no, Putin! Putin, don't look! Putin, no! Oh no, you made Putin cry! You made him cry! Oh god! Why? Why did you make Putin cry? Christians are everywhere. It's one of the most popular religions, so it's probably not a surprise that there are Christian furries. The controversy here comes from a community being primarily by people considered minorities outside of the fandom. People like LGBT folks who have been persecuted and hated by Christians for a long time. So there is of course a distrust of them, and some Christian furs are worried that they'll be annexed from the fandom for their beliefs. But if you aren't homophobic, transphobic, or racist, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Listen to the teachings of your religion, like do unto others. First speech is when you will talk like this. It's very annoying to some, and is mostly used uh, in dual vision and mockery. Weekend Comic is a comic by Zetaharu. It's a comic about two furry dudes who realize they have a dude crush on each other and do acts that only the most bro of dudes can do together. Nothing wrong with a little bro time, you know, hanging out, eating dinner, going to bed together, kissing your friend who you think is asleep but he kisses you back, and it turns out he goofed you. Then your friend says he has feelings for you, and then you bang one out bro style. At first I was worried because the setting is in the lead Joel's house, where he lives with his mom. She calls him kids. But he's 19, so of course he still lives with his mom. I was worried I, w I was worried I scarred my FBI guy. Anyway, it's a cute story. I like stories like this where people find themselves. I'm not commenting on the prawn aspect of it because I stopped reading before that point. I already took my bullet with Fox in the stable. TheDealersDen.com is furry eBay. You can find old fursuits, art, and characters for sale. When some big fursuit maker commits some horrible sin, the owners sprint here to sell their suits off. Furry rave music videos. These are videos from about 11 years ago where people put rave music over a bunch of furry rave themed images. Images that none of them own. Changed is a game about a dude named Colin who wakes up in a facility populated by monsters made of latex who attack and transform the player into a latex monster. It has themes of mind control, conversion, transformation, and the like. You might have seen the character Puro, who is a latex wolf who helps the player. There are multiple endings and you can watch them on YouTube. Sea Salt. Oh boy, sea salt. Sea salt, sea salt, sea salt, sea salt. Sea salt is a character by the artist Red Rusker. Sea salt is in many, many comics that are group related, of which he is the center. 
he receives many, many, many gifts from all of the participants. If you've ever been curious about how much a butt can be spread, you'll have your mind and his hole stretched to its limits. He has to be made of rubber or silicon or something. There's also just buckets and buckets of dude goo, sometimes literal buckets. Knowledge is a curse. Niko Jishi is a visual novel about pretty boys on an adventure. You have the three genders, Bara, Average, and Twink. IT and STEM. This is talking about the shocking amount of furries who are involved in IT and STEM, and by extension, many of the jobs required for a functioning society. Many of you know of the furry who worked on the COVID vaccine. Macro and Micro is the furry kink of giant city-sized furries and Micro being pixie-sized furries. This interest can be softcore, SFW, or NSFW. But the one everyone is aware of is the weird amount of Star Fox Macro art. Why is there so much? Other kin. This isn't really a furry exclusive thing, but becoming a furry leads to discovering you might be one. You probably heard of people talking about how they think furries actually think they're animals and, well, you know we don't. Unless someone is, say, a YouTuber or a VTuber and is trying to keep up the image of them being a funny space creature. <laughs> Hypothetically, of course. Anyway, otherkins are the ones that identify as animals, at least partially. Otherkin are people who identify as not entirely human, some believe that this is caused by a mix-up in the reincarnation progress, a non-human soul planted in a human body. Some say it's because of unusual psychology. I'm not a scientist, and I don't have a religion. But if you're not directly hurting anybody, then I don't really care what you do. And I'll defend your right and freedom to do so. Hand in hand with other kin is Therian. Like other kin, they identify as some earthen animal either spiritually or psychologically. This is distinct from being a furry because furries don't usually identify as an animal, just have an alter ego they adopt that is an anthro creature. If furries are animals, then we can blank is the first half of a sentence that usually ends in we can hunt them like animals, eat them like animals, and kill them like animals. Sure, homie. Let's see how well that one holds up in courts outside of Texas. So furry. Same story as Furry Network, even the same exact controversy. Pup play. This is a kink that extends outside of the fandom, but is also furry adjacent. Pup play is where people will typically wear leather gear, harnesses, collars, and pup hoods. They'll then get trotted around by someone who plays as an owner who treats the human as a dog. Uh, I've never personally tried this stuff, but I did try on a friend's pup hood once, and it was a bit suffocating and restrictive, so I imagine the appeal is that. The restriction of the senses, the difficulty of the breathing, as well as giving up control to someone else. Morei Natsu is another visual novel starring kimono characters and is a gay dating sim. Weasel. Yep, another art site that isn't for affinity. Vor. You should all know what this is by now. Vor is the act of swallowing a character and is a kink. I don't personally understand the appeal. Furry Apocalypse video. This is an animation video about furries being invaded by space marines who slay the furries. The furries prove to be a more powerful foe than they can handle, and the furries win, but not before one of the marines gets shoved up a macro fur's butt, and the other unalives himself with a grenade to unalive the furries grinding on him. At first I was grossed out by the amount of gore, but I mean, who won in the end? The furries. This animation reminded me of Furry Force, which is very similar, and you should check that out but it's equally gross. It's a college humor animation, I think it's four parts, and it's about furry superheroes who defeat their enemies with disturbingly large bulges and massive F-sized titties. Amorous is a dating sim by Jason Aphex. It's highly received and was crowdfunded, and isn't that interesting? It's just a prawn visual novel. The story of Jason himself is much more interesting, but that's an exhausting story of its own. Jason is an animator who takes other people's work and animates it, and that's kind of his whole thing. He once held a Kickstarter for something, and one of the rewards was getting a piece animated by him, which he later turned down the donator because the art wasn't prawn. He's also transphobic and a groomer. Cum lube dependency is because Bad Dragon laces their lubricants with narcotics, causing a severe addiction. Not really. Just that a big signature bit of the design in Bad Dragon Toys is that the inside can be made hollow and have a tube inserted which hooks up to a syringe filled with a sticky lubricant that is made to mimic dude butter. A lot of people who buy their toys get them just for this feature, but that means to get the most out of their toy, they need to get more of this lubricant and Bad Dragon frequently sells out of it. So the dependency is referring to people who refuse to go back to normal lubricants after experiencing this synthetic bro juice. A lot of furries in furry art typically involve immense amounts of dad batter, and because of that they may go through a lot. This is apparently such a problem that there are lots of recipes for homebrew goo. I really didn't need to go on this long about it, but I really wanted to say junk gunk in as many creative ways as possible. 
Thigh highs are an addiction. They're like MSG. They just make everything better. They're common in femboy art, but are also an integral part of trans girl culture. Paw worship is a kink that's like a foot fetish, but it goes into much more obsessive interests, like literal, actual worship of paws. People into this may want to lick feet, massage them, have them put on their face, and just generally throw themselves at someone else's feet. Insect anthros are really cool. Another amazing example of how creative the community is. They take something as creepy and alien looking as insects and turn them into a really cool and cute furry. A good example of art like this would be art by White Mantis. Quote unquote, anthro character models only. Is when you get so into furry stuff that if there is a furry like character in the game, you will always and only play that character. Even if their passives wouldn't benefit your playstyle, or it might even be a detriment to your playstyle, they're a furry, you're a furry, you have to play them, right? Examples of this would be anyone who plays a Khajiit in Elder Scrolls or an Argonian, despite not using sneak or unarmed combat. You know who you are. Previously in this, I knew most of this stuff. Most of this stuff came off the top of my head, and I just researched it for extra context or more stuff to, you know, talk about. But I've been in the fandom for almost 15 years now, so a lot of this stuff I just knew already. This is actually starting to get into some of the stuff that I had to uh, look up, that I had to actually go out of my way to find. So, I'm learning stuff, you're learning stuff, let's get to learning. MFF Gas Attack In 2014, a gas leak occurred at Midwest Fur Fest, releasing chlorine gas into the convention, resulting in the hospitalization of 19 people. No suspects were found or charged, but the police do still count it as an attack. Considering what we know about furry haters and death threats I've gotten, personally, <laughs> I'm not saying it's above them. Zootopia Abortion Comic. I've, I've read this one, I know this one, uh, so I had to share it. This is a fan comic about Judy and Nick's continued relationship that is, that is written very seriously. Judy finds out she's pregnant with Nick's child. She's ashamed and upset by this, and Nick is ecstatic. He's so happy to be a dad, but Judy wants to abort the baby. It's her right to do so. But her reasoning is that this would be one of the very first predator-prey crossbreeds that would most definitely be shunned from society, and the baby might be too big for her to even safely give birth to. She's also concerned it will affect her career at this time. By this framing, you can probably guess the writer's probably not a big fan of abortion or women's rights. But anyway, Nick of course says some horrible close-minded shit like, It seems like you would kill even our own baby for your career. Judy, of course, gets worked up and gives him a big slap. The slap heard around the world. Well, read around the world. I haven't read the full comic yet. Probably won't. Maybe I'll do this live. But, uh, just up to this point. But this comic is supposed to be anti-abortion, but instead it's just pro-funny. Mmm. <laughs> Cheese grater image. Furry art. The Furfinity mascot. Cheese grater. In butt. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> Golden age of the furry fandom is the later 80s, when the fandom was mostly participated in via comics, magazines, and small beats, when it was less secretive and less sexual. I like the idea of comics, but gathering in secret isn't very fun. Uh, most of the people who view this as the golden age are probably people in their 40s to 50s now. God Hates Furries is a now-dead anti-furry site dedicated to cataloging the dark side of the fandom. I guess they don't really need to exist anymore since we publicize the dark side of the fandom. Cothrix is a furry YouTuber who popularized the brand Sona. It's essentially PNG tubing before the name PNG tuber. He made a video called In Defense of Pedophiles that he later unlisted and deleted. If that wasn't enough for you, he hung out with people who drew CP and Kiro, the dead fox fan. He said that no one would care that Kiro is a zoo, because he, er because everyone thinks furries are all zoos anyway. Kothrix distanced himself from the fandom after all of this, of course, and now goes by Kothism. Pachanines is a group who all fursuited in very similar Arcanine fursuits. <laughs> The closest thing that I can find to controversy is that they pointed at a sign about free confidential HIV testing, which isn't a controversy. This is a good thing? Tell me what's bad about promoting sexual health. MFF raised $500,000 for charity. 
Excellent timing for this one, because earlier today, I received a comment talking about how furries are bad because they own $4,000 fursuits and don't give money to charity. I don't personally own a fursuit, and I'm on food stamps. So I'm not exactly hoarding any sort of wealth here. But yeah, if you've even googled furry and charity, you know many instances of furries raising money for various charities. I made a video for the owner of a furry species who fursuits to raise money for the Alzheimer's Association. Rainforest 2015 was a dumpster fire, but they still raised $10,000 for a zoo. And MFF raised a total of half a million dollars for various charities in the entire time it's been running. Such charities include no-kill shelters, MCP Rescue that take care of hard-to-adopt pets like pit bulls, elderly dogs, and special needs animals, and Sit Stay Read. We're such a horrible group that hoards our wealth and doesn't do any good for anyone. Everyone is so quick to talk about the bad minorities of zoos and pedos, but not too many are, t are quick to talk about the overwhelmingly good that the group actually does. I guess it's much more entertaining to make fun of us for the bad that we do than it is for the good that we do. Funny animals is a word used to describe furries before the term was popularized in the 90s. Nazi fur photo. Unfortunately, I don't know which one specifically they're talking about. There's so many pictures of furries in Nazi uniforms, it's like really like, you know they're there, and then, like, every time you're watching, like, furry YouTube, someone will mention, like, there's also, like, the furry Hitler video game, uh, and you just, every so often, you're surprised by a new one, so, like, there's a lot. But unfortunately, because of that, that means there's so many Nazi furs that I can't think of any specific one image that they mean. It could be the picture of Foxler from the Furry Raiders. Maybe it's the picture of the three furries chilling in a room with a giant swastika tapestry. I'm guessing it's the latter one, or the foxler one. Blotch is the art alias of a duo of artists who make beautifully detailed furry paintings. Some of it is just so amazing. It's beautiful art like this that reminds me just how artistically gifted our fandom is. Works like this make being a furry really great because it's just something that you can just show people and it's like, look at how creative our, our community is. Look how amazing this is. Dog Bomb. Dog Bomb is a fursuiter and marathon runner. Dog Bomb was a well-loved and positive furry. Even after his diagnosis of ALS, he was still a positive force in the fandom. He participated in clinical trials with hopes to stop the disease, and with help from the fandom, they raised enough money for ALS research. In 2019, Dog Bomb announced on Twitter that he would be ending his life. He donated his body to research. I can't really comment much as I don't know him at all, but I remember when this happened. My condolences to everyone who lost him that day. First science we previously mentioned when talking about furry surveys. It's a group of scientists working together to increase awareness of furries while also helping to destigmatize them. $100,000 stolen furry NFT is an NFT or non-fungible token that is a piece of 100 furry profile pictures from furries who supported right-click saving NFTs. It's titled, Right Click This. It sold for 20 Ethereum, also known as $100,000. In response, furries in the image d issued DMCA takedown requests and got, it, and got it delisted on OpenSea and Foundation, the two biggest NFT platforms. Guy who made it said he was playing 5D chess, and this just proved the point he was trying to make that furries weren't actually stealing anything, but he was, even though all he did was right click save. MFF Baby Batter Pizza. I think this one might be a typo because the batter pizza was actually done at BLFC. Twitter user Maned Wolfie liked to make uh, dad batter tribute videos and content. Basically, he'd use his batter to better his social standing. Maned Wolfie is a one trick pony, he only does stuff involving bro juice. Anyway, him and 20 other dudes nutted onto a pizza and left it in the hallway for a few minutes. No one talks about his follow-up though, where him and 34 dudes nut in a bong and he smokes it, or the charity event where him and some dudes held a raffle, where for each nut you catch or give, or nut you give on the sea salt dokimakura that was there, you received a raffle ticket, a raffle entry. The winner wins the dirty docky, and others get some other presumed clean dockies and a manscaped package. After some suspicion, people asked the charities, which were for cancer research, and they had no idea. They had no idea this was being done. Maine said it would be rescheduled and wouldn't involve nut shenanigans, but that wasn't true. Everyone remembers the pizza, though. Simply, his entire internet fame is based around him nutting on things, and good for him, I guess. Few of us are so lucky to find our calling. 
Australian Olympics is about how they hired a furry artist to make the mascots and art for the Olympics. The artist is quoted as saying, Rest assured, the people employing me had no idea what furries are. But I do. That sounds so ominous. The art is very cute, and Australia has so many cool animal species, so I think this is really neat. The art is good, and it shows off some of Australia's unique wildlife. Non-furries hated it, of course, and couldn't just appreciate the nice art for what it was. Nice art. Zvaitese is a designer line of fursuits. They have weird, unnatural angles and brand logos on them. The eyes also have a terrifying ping pong ball look. I guess they didn't know that furries like cute fursuits. The Borzoi is exceptionally awful. <laughs> now, you're probably wondering how much they cost. Fursuits already cost between two and four grand. These were six grand. Which I guess isn't that much more, but other than the RAM, they're all very ugly. Phi Paw is an outdated symbol used to identify each other as furries. It's the Phi symbol, which is the Greek letter F with a paw print in it. The only people who use it are anti-furries, even if it's crossed out. Most furries just use a paw print. In online spaces, we're almost always using furry profile pictures, so a symbol isn't really needed. We aren't hiding, and we know how to spot each other. Togepi 1125. I had to look this one up. Good thing I looked it up, because I wasn't expecting an answer to the question I had last time, which was, who is making all that Star Fox macro art? When I was talking about the macro art, I mentioned the sheer plethora of Star Fox macro. Togepi1125 is the one commissioning them all. Glad we figured that out. I'm actually gonna sleep very well tonight because that was, it's like one of those things like it's on the tip of your tongue. Like I thought I knew it, but I didn't know it. So it's, it's good to know to have an answer. It's one of life's many questions finally answered for me. It's like when you can't think of an actor's name and it's on the tip of your tongue and it bugs you until a week later you shout it out in the middle of the grocery store. It's kind of like that. Cameron Bess is a furry astronaut. To Yfinity and beyond. I don't like that I said that. Cool stuff, honestly. There are also pan and use he, she, they pronouns. Space belongs to the furry LGBT now. Burned Furs is a group of furries who have spoken out against extreme sexuality of the fandom and were, in their words, burned at the stake for it. Like most puritanical groups, the group was populated by furries who hate gay people, obscure kinks, erotic artwork. The founder made homophobic remarks before and refused to apologize for them. The other burned furs who had anything to say didn't denounce his behavior, just made excuses for their painting the group as a poorly veiled hate group. This was made worse by their many threats of violence. This is ancient fandom stuff though, before my time. Yep, it happened when I was only 10, six years before I even got into the fandom. Rotten Furs are the polar opposite of Burned Furs. They're a group that arose a couple years after the Burned Furs. Rotten Furs are furries who enjoy various paraphilias that are considered socially unacceptable. All the links to their pages are things like IRC channels, LiveJournal, Yahoo, and IMVU. Stuff that no one really uses, so not a ton of info that I could find, and the, the creator, Rotten Raccoon, has also requested that Wikifur remove their page about them. Their FA says they are into TF, Mind Control, Soul Play, and Vor. Basically, the group advocated for these socially unacceptable kinks and wanted the fandom to be a safe haven for them to explore these kinks unimpeded. SCP-1471 is an SCP that is just furry enough to be looted immensely. SCP stands for Secure, Contain, Protect Foundation. That is like the men in black. They hunt down and house anomalies where they study and examine creatures and objects that may negatively harm man, the planet, the universe, or just be an oddity that no one can explain or determine the use of that is better kept under lock and key. 1471 is one of these anomalies, also known as Mallow, is a application for smartphones that can't be deleted from devices it's installed on. Once installed, 1471 will send images to the device owner through text once every three to six hours. All of the images will show SCP-1471-A, the creature this entry is about, in either the foreground or background of the image. The anomaly is a large human figure with a caned skull for a head and long black hair. Being vaguely caned and wolf-like, furries looted her up immediately. See what I said about furries and wolf girls? During the first 24 hours, the owner of the device just gets images of places the owner frequents. After 48 hours, places of where they recently were. Then 72, the images are updated in real time with the anomaly appearing very close to the device owner. 
in time frames over 90 hours, the subject will see her in their peripheral vision just out of sight. Continued exposure results in her trying to contact, confront, or communicate with the owner, but the owner fails to understand what she's saying. The only cure is to cut the owner's exposure before the 90 hour mark. No one has ever been harmed by Mallow, and the pictures of Mallow are of them hiding or just barely visible until the first week is up. So I guess Furries thinks she's just shy, and this is just her attempt of sharing her version of cryptid Tinder. The app description also says, Never experience loneliness again. She's, she's a little clingy. It's not really my thing, but I'm sure someone, there's people out there that like clingy gals. Diesel Raccoon. I was going to save this for when I talk about furry raiders, but you all might have heard of him a little sooner than the raiders because of his tweet, Inflates You Big and Round. This tweet was made in response to a friend who had tweeted out their disdain of the actions of the domestic terrorist attacks on January 6th. Diesel uses this tweet to say he doesn't agree with his friend, then tries to deflect the subject into kink territory. Diesel is a baby fur and has a video and pics of himself in diapers, which, okay, weird, of course, but oh no, he's also a giant racist. Probably didn't surprise those of you who have heard of furry raiders, but little baby Diesel is also a bad dude. He's not actually affiliated with uh, the furry raiders. He might be like a secret member or something like that. He's just, uh, he's defended Foxler in the past. And we'll get to Foxler later, and you'll find out why Foxler is not a dude you want to defend if you don't want to look like a racist. Anyway, Diesel has posted such amazing gems as, Is it wrong for me to feel nervous when I'm at Walmart late at night and surrounded by black people? Now that sounds horrible, but he also said, I'm not racist at the end, so we're good, right? He responds to someone by saying, I just feel like they're all watching me. One more reason to carry my gun. Ugh, I really need to get drunk for this one. Can someone pass me the Yikes Hard Lemonade? But it doesn't stop there, because nothing can be easy, I guess. I'm getting my concealed carry permit. This black guy flipped and accused me of following him in the store. Diesel worked at Walmart when he made these tweets, so he likely was following this black person around. It does happen. I've gone shopping with black friends, and I've definitely noticed that staff follow us around when we shop that normally don't follow me around. I'm guessing with Diesel's racist history, he probably was following the black person around, probably thinking that they would steal. But this is a wasted effort. Everyone steals from Walmart, and you shouldn't just follow one person. He also likes Mike Electrocute the Gays, Pence, and said if you're refusing to vote for someone because they don't like gay marriage, then you just shouldn't vote. So, gay people just shouldn't be allowed to vote, I guess. Sir, I think you're lost. <laughs> Do you need me to lead you back to the diaper aisle? Because this is the furry fandom, we're all queer here. He frequently refers to himself with a shorthand term for raccoon that's also a racist slur. It's not just racism here. Though Diesel is xenophobic, homophobic, and misogynistic, Diesel is a gay guy, yep. He's gay and homophobic. This is what we call internalized homophobia. He's a conservative who was taught to hate gay people, so he can't separate his political identity away from his actual identity because this is how he was raised. It's hard to unlearn things like this because you have to admit that your entire life up to this point might be wrong or a lie. It's easier for some to just ignore it and double down, or in Diesel's case, try to be both. So we can also add zero self-awareness to this too. Diesel has said, I manage a group of females and they're manipulative little bitches. And after what I went through at work with these females, no wonder I'm gay and like sniffing guys' dirty socks. Yes, he's very public about his kinks. He also has an after dark where it gets even weirder, like being walked around in the woods on a leash in a pup hood and diaper. What he does is what's being roasted here, not the kinks he participates in. But someone who does something like this and in another breath can be a racist could only exist in the furry fandom or politicians. I think it's just important to mention how out of pocket his takes are when he's doing really weird shit, like doing nut tributes on shoes. He's the last person who should be judging anyone. So yeah, Diesel later apologized for his racist tweet, then uh, the January 6th stuff happened, and Diesel tweeted <laughs> stuff in support and said that we patriots lost the battle but will win the war. Keep in mind that I mentioned the furry and Nazi raiders and Diesel together. Diesel is associated with them, but not a member. 
He just defended Foxler a handful of times. So that should have been indication enough to not trust his apology, but it seems his fellow maggots made him feel brave enough to be a shit again. He was successfully banned from a couple of furcons and had to attend the fandom's bronze medal furry con. Free for all. He tried to get unbanned by doing an apology video. Hello all. Um, I just wanted to make this video. Um, I felt it would be better here than it would be um, putting a tweet out or something like that. I wanted you to hear my voice, my tone, see my body language. Um, yeah, uh, he wants us to see his mannerisms and expression, and that's why he's wearing a fursuit to obfuscate his appearance. Gonna write this crap, really. Many of you know what's what's going on, and the drama surrounded with me. See, when someone calls genuine controversies drama, this is the biggest red flag for me. He isn't sorry for what he did, he's sorry he was caught. Calling genuine issues drama is dismissing the seriousness of his actions. He frequently uses, this was X years ago, every time he talks about the things he was sorry for. Mistakes years back, um, as far as making some comments um, that were racist. Um, there was a vine that I did, um, I thought it was funny at the time, but you know, kind of looking at it, even though it was six years ago, is, came off, uh, definitely came off racist. Time doesn't change how inappropriate these things were, and using time as an excuse kind of shows he doesn't take this seriously. Why does every YouTuber apology just suck so much? Layer 5. I originally wrote the notes up to this point all in one night, one long eight hour block. I wanted to do this all in one video, but it just, it just wasn't doable. It's, I mean, we're looking at full movie length now, but yeah. I don't know, I just felt like mentioning that, some behind the scenes, behind the scenes stuff, I guess. Furry Muck is the longest standing muck on the internet. Muck stands for multi-user chat kingdom. Simply, a muck is a text-based online multiplayer role-playing game. No graphics, just text. And this one was a no combat muck. According to the site, they still reach a nightly peak of 400 players. There's a lot of Steam games I pl I've played in the past that don't have that many. RIP VHS. Furry Muck came out before I was born and was 19 years before I first got internet access. So I never got the pleasure of trying this one out. Plushophilia is a kink that sexualizes stuffed animals, also known as plushies. Some mother toys in ways that allow them to use them as an adult toy. The interest can be non-graphic, of course. Autoplushophilia is on the other side of the coin where people interested in it may want to be the stuffed animal that's getting... stuffed. Vanity Fair and that CSI episode made it seem like a large percentage of furries are plushophiles, but a survey showed that less than 1% are into it. It's weird, but it's an inanimate object, and if you're going to make fun of them, maybe you should put your real doll back in the closet so she doesn't have to see you typing hate comments. One-sixth of furries are zoos. A study came out, but I can't find the source. It said that 18% of furries are zoos, but before you say ew and slam your laptop, I found a much more recent survey from Fur Science in 2019 that says only 6.9% of furries have an interest in zoophilia. Both questions were also asked without asking the what level of participation these zoophiles were engaging in. So not all of them are actually committing zoophilia, but anyway, animals and children cannot consent. And even if they could, there is a massive power dynamic at play in both social dynamics and intelligences that would make this wrong. Dogs are naturally subservient and just aren't capable of saying no, even if they had the ability to speak. Animals and children cannot protect themselves, and it's our job as adults to protect them and their environment. Anything less than that is just really, really crappy. Arming children and animals isn't protecting them. If you're a zoo or a pedo, do yourself a favor and everyone else and go base jumping without a parachute. Hypnotist Sappho is a furry YouTuber who made videos about having fun in VR chat and recording their hypnotism sessions that they held online. Sappho is also a self-admitted zoophile and was very open about that. And I want to clear the air and say that for the record, I am a zoophile. I am more attracted to dogs. Unacceptable! They flat out said in a video that where they outed themselves as a zoo because they didn't want someone else to find it and, you know, beat them to the punch. You know, similar in the situation to what happened with Kiro. Hypnotist wanted to be the one to 
admit it. They wanted to beat the clout chasers to it. Their words. They didn't want the rug to be pulled out from underneath them. You can see in their video how zoo files really think. They consider themselves better than zoo sadists like Hero, and just they don't even consider themselves in the same league as zoo sadists whatsoever. Sappho even compared the hate and quote unquote discrimination of zoos as being equal to the fight for civil rights of black and queer people. Because of doing this on YouTube, the internet had a heyday with it. Tons upon tons of React videos coming out about it all on the same day. But zoophilia is just one of Sappho's offenses. They were also busted for grooming by participants in their chat. Turkey Charm has a video about it that goes over everything in extreme detail if you want to see that. 1992 Art Auction refers to the sale of a particularly famous art piece of two rat dudes going to the bone zone. You know, bro stuff. You might remember it when John Oliver mentioned it a few times on his show. Uh, if you're not a, if you're younger than a millennial, uh, John Oliver's a, a a talk show comedian. He's he says he's not a furry but he does make a lot of jokes about being romantically interested in horses, and now he owns a piece of furry art history. He's a furry. He doesn't really have a choice. John Oliver's a furry. Tristan McAvery is a writer, voice actor, and furry who voiced Gendo Ikari, the lead's father in Neon Genesis Evangelion. I know it's a little late, but you know, congratulations on getting the job. Congratulations! 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 congratulations. Congratulations! 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 Thank you all. Rod O'Reilly is one of the founding fathers of the organized side of the fandom. He co-founded Conference and handles programming for Califer. His sona is a mink and he is a vegan that doesn't use leather. You know, a vegan vegan. He participates in environmental, animal rights, and anti-violence issues and is a libertarian activist. He's also a musician and plays in the band Illegal Operation and Dr. Zeus. I personally don't know much about the old fandom. Don't hug cacti boycott. DHC is a really big fursuit maker in the fandom being one of the big ones and at one point was the go-to person to get a suit from. Lucky, the owner has several allegations against her with lots of proof. There's a massive document that would make a video longer than this iceberg, or the iceberg that I have planned in the future. We're only 20 pages in on this iceberg, and the document about Lucky is 100 pages long. Many of these allegations include sexual assault, grooming, talks about her hating her clients, animal abuse. She admitted in posts that she'd adopt animals just to abuse them kill them, or leave them out in her yard to die. She admitted to these animal rights violations in posts where she made it seem like she was doing them a favor. It wasn't just dogs, she apparently had several species of pets like cats and birds, and all of them died while under her quote-unquote care. It's not like she did this not knowing any better, she had many friends who are knowledgeable in animal care who warned her and Lucky wrote them off as just being quote-unquote nosy bitches. One such case was a bird she wasn't taking care of, and a friend said it would develop behavioral issues if Lucky were to continue. Lucky ignored the friend and of course the bird became too much for Lucky to handle and Lucky was forced to give them up. I don't know which bird this is, but my experience with birds, it's probably a cockatoo. Cockatoos are pretty unruly and have some pretty bad behavioral issues. They're a tropical bird, they are not meant to be kept as pets. She had pet rabbits who she let wander around freely without neutering them and soon, Five bunnies turned into 15. Some bunnies even escaped or got eaten by local wildlife. Uh, as a rabbit owner myself, it is very important for rabbits to be in a male-female pairing for mental health and general well-being. But even then, I kept Shadow away from Stormy, separated by, uh, they had their two cages, their two enclosures very close to each other so they could still sniff at each other from beyond the cage and clean each other. But I still kept them separate from each other until Shadow was properly clipped. Now I let them run around the living room and they just cuddle and do whatever they want all day. Lucky is also very open about her zoo interests. She has admitted that her first time having sex... She's also very open about her zoo interests. She admitted that her very first time having adult relations was with her family dog. Ew. And has Art of Persona doing the same with a German Shepherd. She has a German Shepherd as a pet. Her character also has a symbol on her that zoos use to identify each other. It's similar to the Zeta symbol. I'm not going to share specifically what it is because it's a really common symbol and someone could have that on their fursona and accidentally, you know, get accused of being a zoo because it is a really common symbol. She's a transphobe who would misgender her friends and use their dead names 
If you don't know what a dead name is, a dead name is the name of a trans person they used before coming out as trans. Of course, being the ultra famous creator she is, it was hard for people to stop being friends with her due to the social power that she holds over them. Power dynamics like this are rife with abuse. People were afraid to call her out for these behaviors because they're worried about how she could hurt their presence in the fandom. This fear wasn't unfounded either, as anyone who dare call out the queen would be made fun of behind their back, and because of her social standing would get these people ostracized, alienated, blocked, and effectively annexed from her community because people rather side with the famous person than an actual victim. The other alternative is she'd block any detractors or even friends who she was friends with for many years who dared disagree with her. These weren't mean things. They thought Lucky could do better, as friends do. It's really disappointing to have a friend who misgenders you or just treats other people poorly or does bad things because you're friends with them. You always expect them to be able to do better. And that's what Lucky's friends expected. They expected her to do better. And her response was to block them and prove continually that she was irredeemable at every opportunity that she could. The boycott was an act of protest against DHC because we shouldn't support a person like this being in our fandom. We shouldn't give an abuser this much power and money because that just makes them more powerful and more capable of abusing people. Also, she sent a cease and desist to the person who made the thread and threatened legal action against them, forcing the writer to lawyer up. So it looks like she can't block her way out of this problem, so she instead abuses the American legal system. That said, if you own a DHC fursuit, you don't need to burn it, you don't need to sell it, you probably didn't know she was like this when you gave her your money, and it's too late now. She already has the money. Just make sure that you mention you don't support her behavior, but there's nothing that can be done about it now that you own the suit. You could get the head referred by another fursuit maker if you wanted to, but I don't think that's necessary as long as you make it clear that others shouldn't buy her suits. Thankfully, the Twitter account seems to be dead as they haven't had any Twitter activity since sending the cease and desist. Although the website is still active and doing orders. Albedo Anthropomorphics is a furry comic book which started the furry comic book subgenre. It was known for having serious adult stories for characters that were previously just known as funny animals, taking fandom content from just cute and silly animals in Disney cartoons to serious stories of war, sci-fi, and political intrigue. The comic ran from 1983 to 2005. F-List is a furry role-playing site made for those of an adult palette. F-List is also known for its massive list of kinks that include the mundane to the mind-boggling to the- oh wait, no, that's, <laughs> that's actually a crime. F-List hosts a series of forums where people can roleplay in public or just find people to roleplay with in private messages. You had to message an admin and then justify the group and what the group was about and they would deem whether your group was uh, worth having or worth, you know, adding. People still use it to host their kink list and share it on furry dating sites and the like. Confederate fursuiter is a fursuiter who goes around to cons in a fursuit designed to look like the confederate flag. If you're not an American, the confederate flag is problematic because the flag represents the southern states in the civil war. The southern states seceded from the Union because they didn't like that the North wanted to make it illegal to own slaves. We went to war with each other over it, and the war ended with the South surrendering, and some southerners like to keep the flag flying because it's quote-unquote their heritage. They're very proud of losing and giving up. Some insist this wasn't an issue with owning people, but it was about states' rights. States' rights to what? Own people? <laughs> If you see someone with a confederate flag nowadays, you know they either really like moonshine, their cousins, or hating black people and other minorities. So when a dude shows up to cons wearing a colorful version of the Klansman's uniform, people take some issues with it. He was banned from pretty much every furry con except Free For All, which just ended up sucking. Uh, people even called that furry con Fash Con. The fursona is called Arkansas. I would have called it Alabama. But the owner, Magnus, is known for owning a lot of fursuits, but only a couple of bad ones. Arkansas was banned at his premiere at MFF and was banned until 2017 for his own safety, according to the staff. They knew he'd probably get his ass kicked. Someone else wore the suit for him in the suit parade, who also, un <laughs> who also ended up getting banned. He was also banned from Anthrocon for trying to conceal the confederate flag on his suit with a sheet. The suit was banned and then he was when it was discovered he never paid for his entry. I guess he didn't want to pay to go to a con and just to get kicked out. Arkansas isn't the only time he got in trouble for suiting. When he returned to MFF he was banned again. He then returned in another suit that wore a World War I outfit where he shouted Hail Victory in German. You know the one. It's the one that goes with the Nazi salute, starts with a Sieg. After this he was taken away by the police. The con pressed charges against him for trespassing and battery. He tried to raise the money for his defense, but later deleted the GoFundMe. 
He has a criminal history aside from this, including being charged with terroristic threats. Easy cooldown and the US military. You know that fursuiting is like super sweaty business, right? Well, furries are always looking for ways to cool themselves off. Lots of heads are made with vents or even tiny PC fans inside for circulation. But one Dutch furry made a vest called Easy Cooldown. You strap it on, zip it up, then put in cold packs in the lining. One person who bought it is in the military and wore it during drills to help with the heat. But that's not all. Navy troops in Japan ordered some to ship to military bases and ended up buying 10 vests, then 20, then 30. The creator of the vest still has no clue how they heard about the vest, and he doesn't have any contracts with them, but they now regularly sell a lot of vests to these groups, where they are used by all sorts of people like the military, athletes, cosplayers, EMTs, and more. The reason these vests are very useful to the military is that the vests the military uses cycle and require power supplies and are heavy and bulky, but these easy cooldown vests are much cheaper and more effective for when they're sitting in super hot tanks all day. Voodie was a cartoonist's amateur print association that was centered around funny animals. The point of Voodie was to gather similar cartoonists to share and discuss funny animals in print. Voodie was unique at the time of release because many zines about the fandom were text only, despite the fandom always being about art. Voodie had cartoonists backing it, cartoonists who even worked for Mad Magazine, which was a comedy magazine that parodied pop culture. Voodie is also where our next subject premiered, Omaha the Cat Dancer. At the time, Voodie didn't have a lot of lewd or adult imagery or content in it, which was common at the time. So as per suggestion that was made, Omaha was created. Omaha is an erotic comic strip set in a furry universe in an alternate Minnesota starring a cat girl exotic dancer and her lover Chuck who was the son of a businessman. What was different is these comics weren't boning for the sake of boning. It had a deep and serious story where boning occasionally being involved was relevant to the story. Omaha has also been the subject of many controversies being one of the more popular early furry NSFW comics. It was seized by multiple countries for being indecent materials and some comic stores were even charged fines for selling it. Toronto police even said the comic was bestiality because of the furry boning. In 1992, two volumes of images starring Omaha were made in order to help pay for Adam Waller, the creator's bowel cancer treatment. It featured a lot of contributions from famous comic artists like Dave Sim, Alan Moore, Frank Miller, Trina Robbins, James Vance, Neil Gaiman. As a quick side note, I forgot that some of my audience might not be old enough to remember these names, but these are huge writers. Alan Moore wrote the graphic novel Watchmen. Frank Miller wrote big graphic novels like Batman, The Dark Knight, 300, and Sin City. Trina Robbins was the first female writer to write Wonder Woman comics, and Neil Gaiman wrote Coraline. So these are huge, huge, huge names to be writing for what is an indie furry comic. There was a lot of negativity for Omaha, but that was because it was ahead of its time. The fandom definitely owes a lot to Omaha, and most of us never even knew she existed. Conference Zero 1989 is the first proper furry convention. Fred Conquest is a prototype furry. Patient Zero, if you will. He was the first documented furry and fursuiter. Sort of. There's a saying, never work with children or animals if you're an actor. This is because neither have a non-zero chance of pooping themselves in front of you. Animals can't always provide a consistent acting experience, and in that case, Fred would don his fursuit and play the animals in the play. Fred did this in the 1900s and 1910s. If you count this as furry culture, then the fandom has been around longer than anyone speaking today could be. The suits are pretty good for the time and look better than most people's first attempts at suits but they do have a very weird and uncanny appearance. I don't see this on the list, so I'm adding it here myself since Plushophilia is here. Cub and baby furs are furries that have fursonas that are babies or children. They roleplay as kids, and in my experience talking to them, they never engage in sex acts while in this mindset. Like Feral, it's one of those things like, yeah, it's not real, but that's still a little too close for me to be comfortable with. Some participate in ABDB... Some participate in A B D B that you um you had you 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 could you do. Some participate in A B D L, which stands for Adult Baby Diaper Lover. Due to this art and content, sometimes getting into the creepy or borderline illegal territory, it's often banned from sites. So I don't really see them outside of places like F List and Twitter. The problem with this group, like every group, comes from the people who can't separate reality from fiction. 
Some use this as a way of coping with trauma, so I'm not going to tear into it. Some like to be babied and taken care of because their parents were extremely shit at taking care of them and didn't meet their child's psychological or emotional needs. The existence of this kind of roleplay goes all the way back to 1995 when the nursery first opened on Furry Muck. Yodzdenu, Furry God, isn't on this list, but I think it deserves a mention. I'll be calling them Eo because the name is deliberately not meant to be able to be pronounced. Eo is a character who gets art of them influencing events in history as a big wolf character with two big wings with yin-yang symbols on their wings. The owner commissioned a few pieces before the one that brought them into the limelight. This picture of Eo guiding the shot of the man who killed Archduke Franz Ferdinand. This is the event that sparked World War I. Eo is described as a godlike character who thinks of men as ants, yet is still interested enough to mess with our history. Eo apparently just has fun screwing with time. I put Eo here because despite both me and Updog, my friend being in the fandom for so long, he had only just learned about this last week. Sally Acorn Love Doll. I made so many additions to this, to this whole iceberg. But Sally Acorn Love Doll is a life-sized homemade doll of the Sonic character Sally Acorn. For a lot of Sonic fans, this character was their sexual awakening. While weird on its own, what made this really weird is that the doll isn't made with fursuit creation techniques, which would make sense and would result in a much more lifelike body. Instead, it was built around a wooden skeleton, and people saw these wooden bones and thought they were real human bones. The doll has gone through many redesigns, and the owner wants to finish her and figure out how to mass produce her for the other fans <laughs> who are interested in the Sally Acorn love doll. Foxler Nightfire if you're on YouTube, it might be hard to find information on this person specifically. Foxler has a YouTube in which he uploaded a lot of content, so results are just blasted with videos about himself. Many people know of him, but I had to do a little more searching into finding the info I needed, which is why Foxler and the Furry Raiders wasn't in the original video. Foxler also has a history of copyright striking people like Labrat who make videos about the group because his fursuit is in it. This didn't happen when I offhandedly showed it last time, so let's push my luck. Foxler is the founder and leader of the social political group called the Furry Raiders. The group uses the deliberately Nazi-esque furry-themed armband as their logo and is worn publicly by many members of the Raiders. Foxler, of course, denies that he himself is a Nazi of any sort, but has posts on FA that are tagged Nazi and Furzy, and has claimed to be one himself in the past. Isn't the internet wonderful? Most people don't search this stuff, so you can just claim whatever you want. But there's always someone out there who's doing the research. Anyway, this art was his reference sheet of his persona, the art that was tagged as Nazi and Furzy. He's been seen doing Nazi salutes in photos, the swastika armband modification of course, the modification of the Nazi flag with the iron cross replaced with the fox head, paid money to join a neo-Nazi group, has gone on the record saying he hates black people and would join the KKK, saying he stands with Hitler, and has referred to himself as the Hitler of the fandom, but also says he's not a Nazi. Crazy. Weird how that works. He paid to join a neo-Nazi group and he doesn't consider himself a Nazi? I feel like that would make you like an actual card-carrying member at that point. He also says he is part of the alt-right. Let's call it what it is. The alt-reich. So yeah, I don't see why people would ever think he's a Nazi. We clearly just have him mixed up. Good lord, what a jackass. If being a member of the Third Reich wasn't enough, Foxler has admitted to knowingly engaging in sex RP with a minor, was accused of coercing a 16-year-old girl to run away from home, and offered to send her money and a puppy. He also admits that he likes fursuits because it allows him to use a deceptively cute fursuit to entrap people and let people, even children, let their guard down around him. Foxler was also a part of the Zoophile Telegram leaks, admitted to sex with a canine as a teen, claims that dogs are inherently sexual beings, Frenched a dog, and had an account on Beast Forum, which is a zoo site, and has zoophilia as a faved kink on his F list. Furry Raiders, as previously mentioned, is an alt-right political furry group that uses Nazi iconography. Many of its participants are zoophiles, zoosadists, or pedos, and are known with trying to get Milo Yiannopoulos into the fandom. Milo is another member of the alt-reich, and is loved by many alt-furs for being a gay alt-writer. Although, Milo has since stated he has cured his homosexuality and is straight now. Milo also told the Raiders that they should destroy MMF and ruin the fandom for all of their detractors. Because in Milo's words, you gotta hit them where it hurts. Anyway, Milo and Frey Raiders have been banned by a lot of cons, and most recently attended Free For All, aka Fashcon. 
Crusader Cat is a member of the Furry Raiders who is easily spotted by dressing like a Nazi and having a stupid blonde bowl cut. Crusader didn't like furries at first because he thinks we're all just sex crazed zoos. Once he found out that there were Christian furries, he changed his tune. His religion is very important to him and he tries to use the fandom to spread the message of Christianity. He did so once at cons by dealing out chick tracks, which are little comics about Christian lessons, but he put his own little furry spin on them. So nothing crazy here besides his Nazi stuff and that he admitted to banging his cat on YouTube. Oh crap. Oh, uh, did I forget to mention that last one? Zosh is someone who has ties to Kothrix and Kiro, but rarely gets mentioned with them or at all really. People tend to entirely ignore him until everyone collectively remembers that he draws CP. Zosh is a longtime artist in the fandom, also known as Adam Wan, and made the species Citra. So if you're wondering why I haven't discussed this species yet, it's because I can't discuss it without talking about this subject. Zosh has uh, been busted for using actual CP in order to draw CP furry art as a reference. So yeah, kind of hard to talk about a species and go, oh look how cool and cute this species is, without also talking about how this dude is a pedo. Kind of ruins the whole video, you know? You can't keep getting away with it! He can't keep getting away with it! He won't. Layer 6. The end. We've arrived in the deep dark. The horrid underbelly of the phantom, so far into the dark sea that we aren't sure what actually lives down here. If such harsh conditions permit survival, then I fear what would call this home. Drug culture. Nothing mixes quite as well as large animal-like suits and psychedelics. Personally, I think this experience would be a horrifying one, but yeah, there is a drug problem. I'm not talking about the fun, safe stuff that's legal in some states like cannabis, mushrooms, and other psychedelics. One party at MFF, for example, was a pill party. You'd come in and drop a pill into the bowl and then take one. You have no idea what you're taking. The other problem is the social aspect. These drugs are taken at parties and social events and used to heighten your senses and experiences in a zone you'd already consider pretty enjoyable further linking these drugs with good times in your head. This means getting easily addicted. After all, coke, the powder, is something that is taken only socially and in small amounts but can turn into multiple bumps a night and can result in heart attacks or, or cocaine-induced cardiotoxicity. Just don't do drugs, kids. I can't even smoke because that junk makes me paranoid and edibles even more so. But, you know, cannabis is fine. Alcohol is fine if you're old enough, but drink in moderation. Too much of a good thing can be a bad thing too, if proper safety and precautions aren't taken. Be smart when you indulge in good times. Messy Tales, the brown-nosed pup, is a Twitter furry who enjoyed and reveled in eating feces. He has been institutionalized for this by his family, and has taken a few pics of his fursuit turning from white to brown. He fantasized about being force-fed feces, and people think he died from it, but no one knows for sure. Zooville is a forum where zoophiles publicly gather and share prawn and other adult materials, as well as instruct and educate people on how to participate in these acts. I googled it because it sounded like a game name, like for Villa or something. Nope. It's a site zoophiles use. It's still active because it shows timestamps next to posters. It's 3am and I'm seeing posts as recent as 10 minutes ago. I didn't click any threads, but I'm already wanting to throw my hard drive out. See Martin Croker's Forbidden File. Croker is an animator and voice actor from a few adult swim shows who died from unknown causes. It was rumored that he'd left behind a lot of drawings, artwork, and memorabilia. One of the secret treasure troves was an NSFW art file. It has not been found, but one of the drawings in it is said to be a picture of Tom and Jerry participating in scat stuff. Scat means poop, if you didn't know. The image was confirmed to exist by Croker's friends and peers, but wasn't recovered, which means many more of Croker's secret picks haven't been recovered either. Confuzzled HIV Furs Chart is a chart of a furry called Rico Tiger in the UK fandom who attends Confuzzled and Euro France every year, where he'll engage in unprotected boning with people not telling them that he has HIV. The chart shows a large tree of people he has infected, 
as well as those people who have continued to unintentionally infect others. 33 possible people who are known carriers. HIV is a serious disease that can turn into full-blown AIDS. While HIV is treatable and is no longer a death sentence, if it develops into AIDS, it can be a death sentence, and at the least, treatment is expensive. If these people don't get diagnosed, then that means Rico is potentially committing 33 acts of murder. Manslaughter would mean it's an accident, but Rico knows he has it, and continues to spread it. This is why things like HIV testing at cons is a good thing. You can sleep with someone you trust, but you can't guarantee they're clean. You can't guarantee that they're being honest. Or you can't even guarantee that they know for sure. Because you can accidentally have it. You can accidentally catch it from someone. Sex at cons can't be banned because they're happening in private, at hotels, and shouldn't be banned. But people should be educated and should get tested. If you engage in sex at all, you should get tested multiple times a year, and before and after sleeping with a new partner. Wear protection, and if you experience flu-like symptoms a few weeks after engaging in sex with someone new, then get tested. Be responsible, and if you get HIV, make sure to call your partner and every recent partner so that they can get tested and prevent the spread too. North Fur's Dolphin Prosthetic Nightmare warning. It's a latex dolphin nose. They make plenty of others too, like monkeys, and they're all pretty equally terrifying. Auschwitz diaper drawing is a picture of a Nazi kissing an Auschwitz prisoner while both are wearing diapers. Gross in a lot of different ways. On the iceberg, this is called the plushy sample fursuit. They're actually talking about carpet samples fursuit, or at least that's how I've heard of it always was carpet samples. It's a fursuit made of various carpet samples. It's weird, terrifying, and apparently smelled awful. It was allegedly made of used carpets and wasn't cleaned and people aren't entirely sure if this was done in satire of poorly made suits or if it was made in complete honesty. Side note, well, I guess main note now, Originally when I wrote this, I was doing a lot of these from memory, and then went back and researched some just in case. It's of course not as simple as a weird guy making a weird suit. North Scylla was right to label this as plushy sample suit, because this isn't a carpet suit sample fursuit. But... I don't want to say it, but I made it this far, so... It's made of stuffed animals who he has sexually conquered, and the smell is from stuffed animals he nutted in and used as material without washing. It gets worse though. The owner is into NSFW cub art and makes it. He once asked a con goer if he'd be able to participate in acts with her handicap assistance dog. While a lot of info about him isn't documented on Wikifur, there is lots of first-hand accounts of him openly talking about how much he likes to bang animals, and a story of someone who was just minding their own business eating lunch when he started talking about genitalia out of nowhere. He also has a swastika tattoo on his forehead. He is also a self-admitted pedo, and I can't really show you his art because it's just that graphic. He's also 50 and is way past old enough to know better. Even his daily life is shaped around giving him access to new victims, like working as a dog walker for a local shelter. Thankfully, he hasn't posted in over a decade and even doxed himself with his phone number and address, so hopefully this means the authorities got involved. Vex and Jax are a couple who did furry art and fursuits and were actually quite talented. They are both convicted of the murder of a man who they lured into their home using a dating app with the intent to murder him. What's weird is that they openly talked about this with a friend, and that's what led to them getting caught. The body was later found in the home. They also adopted a dog, killed him, and skinned him for use in a fursuit. Both are in jail now. They talked a few times about attempted unaliving and their self-destructive tendencies. I don't know if that's related to the crime, but mental health is rough, and if you're thinking about hurting yourself or others, please admit yourself into a mental health facility so that you can get the help that you need. Mental health is bad in America, but it's a far cry from what it used to be. Please seek help when you need it. The Fullerton homicide is the triple murder by two men in the furry fandom. All of those involved, including the victims, were furries as well. I couldn't find a ton of info on it. Because anytime I searched the Fullerton homicide and furry homicide and stuff like that, it kept leading back to Vex and Jax. Growly. This is another one of those long ones. Yep, this is another one of those long ones. Growly is a fursuiter who wears a Growlithe fursuit. He's very sensitive about his fursuit. It smells like garbage. He d and it doesn't look good. And isn't being properly maintained at all. Growly insists it's because it's made of inferior materials. You can tell this isn't an inferior material so much as using his suit for boning and not cleaning it. Growly and his ex were also charged with making prawn content with a minor. Both him and his ex both fought the charges for as long as possible until pleading no contest to lewd acts with a minor, about one-fourth of what they were actually being charged with. Growly denies that this is how it went down and says it was entirely his ex's doing. He claims he only got wrapped up in it because he was sleeping in the same room as it was happening, but Growly also admitted to sending pictures of 
of his junk to minors. Riley tried to fool the DA with his story during sentencing, but the deal they gave him was to plead no contest, and there was a very short time limit on this offer. Had Riley chose to wait longer, court would resume and he'd be given way worse and get full charges. Not long after he got out of serving time in jail for two years, he went back to what he was doing before jail. He used Fur Affinity to message and solicit noodles for minors. Dragoneer, an admin from FA, banned him for this, but said numerous times that it was a hard decision for him because they were friends. Bro, are you kidding, right? You're, you're you're joking, right? You're not you're not being for real. I've cut off lifelong friendships with people just for them being misogynists. If my friend was a pedo, you'd have me dialing the cops long ago. The ban wasn't enough to stop Growly. He sought out minors off-site using AOL Instant Messenger. Numerous times Growly tried to delete documentation of these events on Wikifur by deleting the sections about his convictions, even though Growly is on the sex pest registry, meaning that this information is already public. Meaning, it's not defamatory. It's not defamatory if it's the truth. Shortly after he was once again convicted of more child prawn charges, and he was still allowed to go to work at conventions after this, shortly after he once again was convicted of more child prawn charges, and he was still allowed to work at conventions after this. They did this even though the community was very open about not wanting him in the fandom, let alone cons. I don't know if it was because the con staff was too forgiving of him, or just totally ignorant of the charges, but that's really dumb. There were a lot of upset people, some even discussed how it was weird that Uncle Kage would ban the Tyra Banks couple from attending because they discussed the sexual side of the fandom on TV. Milo, Milo Yiannopoulos was even banned from cons in advance the second someone made him a fursona. I mean, rightfully so, cause fuck that guy, but... They did nothing about Growly, a convicted sex offender. Some cons did ban him outright, while others sort of vaguely banned him by banning suitors with poorly maintained or stinking suits. Actually, it was the ban against convicted sex pests, but both apply here. My thought is, with their history with Dragoneer, the FA admin, they probably got special treatment and was allowed to continue attending. We all know how hard it was to ban their pedo friend from FA. They probably fought for his right to attend cons because they thought he sh shouldn't be banished from the fandom. But that's just my speculation. Anyway, he can't attend most cons now because they keep indirectly banning him through banning sex pests. Dragons banging cars. It's obscure stuff, and it is memed about, but there's a lot of art there of dragons banging one out with various vehicles meant for transportation, not for boning. Happy birthday photo is a photo of two fursuiters celebrating a birthday in what looks like a dilapidated building with one looking directly at you. It's very cursed. I can't tell if we walked in on something we weren't supposed to see or if we're being held hostage or maybe we walked in on some like weird ritual. There's also a couple other related pictures that make the house look even scarier than just this one here. I'm kind of curious what the deal is with that house. Now for the final and most devastating one. Everyone is a furry when they're a kid. Yep, you watch Disney. Maybe you pretended to be an animal at playtime. You've been a furry since you first started making memories. Zooier Than Now is a podcast hosted by furries that are openly zoophiles and use their podcast platform to spread the message of those individuals. Actually, only Toggle is a furry. The other one, Doug, is not a furry and is appropriating uh, furry culture in order to allow himself to essentially hide in plain sight. They compare things like zoophilia to the civil rights movement and threaten legal action against any detractors or threaten doxing. I also remember Sappho mentioning she was inspired by ZTT to get into YouTube and being and accepting themselves as zoos. Toggle and Doug are two furries and use our fandom and say things like half of the furries they meet are cool with zoophilia. Comments like this are speculation and personal experience, not real numbers. As I mentioned previously, there are actual studies and surveys done with real numbers and a much larger reach, and they estimate the amount of zoos to be closer between 6 to 12%, which isn't great, but it's not half. It's not half. Most furries hate ZTT, of course. Also, one of them is a total idiot and is the peak of the Dunning-Kruger effect. He is convinced that he's some sort of technological wizard and said that there is no way anyone would be able to figure out who he was, which lasted about a week because he has publicized his face in a video before and matched his voice up to a different video that he was in. They supposedly hate zoo sadists, like many zoophiles say they do. 
but they say Kira was groomed into doing his zoo sadism, which doesn't really matter because he still did it. And he's also grown and knows better. Zoo files in general, outside of being a zoo, are a very weird group. There is something about their community, for lack of a better word, that goes hand in hand with exhibitionism and narcissism. It's not enough for them to be it's not enough for them to do this disgusting and unforgivable act. They have to make their participation in it public. They have to make content for it. They have to be heard or seen doing it. It has a weird sense of narcissism to it, and maybe that's just the side effect, but they mask it behind fighting for zoo rights. Well, we might never know what's really wrong with people like this, but at least this addiction to attention makes it very easy to find them. And if they're easier to find, they're easier to oust and easier to get behind bars. Cord Kitty. Cord Kitty, I don't believe is a super secret thing, but this news is somewhat recent, so it's way down here because you'd have to be paying pretty close attention to the junk going on in the darker parts of the fandom. Also, I was going to put it on layer 5 since Turkey Tom did a video on it, but uh, one of the several people Cord has associated with is in this layer already, like Growly. This one is also going to be massive. Cord Kitty's initial online presence was just uploading fursuit dance competition videos and participating in dance competitions himself. Like many controversial furries, he lacks self-awareness. He made a song about stinky fursuits while he himself wore a fursuit that was known for its intense reeking. He claims to follow all of the advice given to make sure it doesn't stink and asks if fursuiters should shower more than once a day while fursuiting. I'd say it couldn't hurt, especially since he dances. Fursuiting is already very sweaty work. To, so, so to dance on top of that, yeah, take more than one shower a day when you're fursuiting. But from the descriptions, this smell isn't a sweat smell. And imagine how bad it must be for other fursuiters to say it reeks. Fursuit heads are usually made of thick layers of foam, like up to three inches thick of foam, working like essentially working like triple masking. If smelling bad was his only crime, he'd be higher up on the iceberg, but the accusations against Cord make him a pretty dangerous individual that shouldn't be allowed to go to cons. In 2017, Cord Kitty tried to bring his infant child to a baby fur meetup. I've discussed baby furs before and how the interest can be non-sexual, but there are some who do participate in it sexually. At the least, this is a bad idea, and very stupid, and very tone-deaf. Some would say a fur con is not a safe place for children, so imagine how bad many would feel about this move. Cord ended up not doing it, but justified his reason for wanting to because he says, Baby fur isn't a fetish group, it's people who choose a baby fursona. Yes, they have their weirdos and pedo bears, obviously, but it's possible to be a baby fur and not be into hurting babies. To me, just that he acknowledges the existence of pedos in that community should be reason enough to not bring his kid. I mean, I feel like that if I knew there was a chance that even one pedo might be there, I would just not bring my kid. He also seemed to want to do it for a gag, like he wanted to see how baby furs would react to a real baby being there. He even said that was his plan, but stopped because people threatened to call CPS, Child Protective Services. To me, that he chose not to is proof enough, to me at least, that he thought what he was doing was wrong, or at least knew better. He was also following NSFW cub accounts on his public Twitter. He was also following accounts that made cub prawn. Remember how I mentioned he lacked self-awareness? The dude himself is probably a pedo. Later, he walks back his statements with, It was just a prank. I'd never bring my kid in. He also tweeted out, Hashtag baby fur lives matter, showing that he likens the struggle of baby fur's experience to BLM. Which is not just wrong, but makes him look like a racist. This infantilizes the BLM movement, as well as indirectly calls it absurd by using his very own absurd parallel. Let's keep in mind though, this dude is an individual, a very fucked up individual at that. Let's not conflate his actions and behavior with others. It's important I say that because it gets worse. He has an F-list where he says his fave kinks are age play, 
inexperienced partners, and zoophilia. There's a lot here, so this is going to sound like a list. In a custody battle with his ex whom he had children with, the same children previously mentioned, he had his browsing history brought into question. Such bookmarks, not searches, but bookmarks like bookmarks on a guide to intercourse with dogs, a page called Dog Yif Questions, and a page with Zeusatus content. His excuse for those was that he was using it to study abnormal psychology. I'm guessing he meant his own psychology because of his F-list info. He's also commissioned Feral and SFW of his cat persona doing the do with dogs. Honestly, this list of offenses is so painfully long that I'm just going to jump ahead. His ex-wife walked in on him doing the peanut butter trick with his dog. He followed many Zeusatus on his main Twitter and other disturbing people like General Fulfi, a Zeusatist and has been following him all the way up until 2021. Kentari, an ex-vet tech who is now a zoophile. Foxler, everyone's favorite armband wearing fox, who is a zoophile married to a pedo. Toast Rabbit busted for CP charges, pled guilty, and also used to date 2 Griffin. Which, dating 2 Griffin on its own is pretty bad, but also to add that you're a pedo on top of it, that's, that's, I mean, doesn't get much worse than that. Crusader Cat, which we've discussed already. Jason Aphex, groomer, transphobe. Uh, also made a Zoophilia comic. Growly, who we've discussed. Many people from the Zoophile Telegram leaks, and holy crap, many, many more people. Cord also groomed and very strongly tried to coerce a 17-year-old into sex while he was 27. Remember how I mentioned one of his fave kinks was inexperienced partners? His defense for his pedophilic actions was that pedophile is just for people who like people under the age of 11. So he's technically a teleophile. What the fuck? <laughs> what the fuck? This, this whole thing is so exhausting. And he's been on numerous podcasts where he's been interviewed, and every time he just digs a hole deeper and deeper, uh, he says that uh, a lot of his uh, exposure to zoophile content is his mother showing him videos of this stuff and laughing at it because they thought it was funny. I hope his family's not actually like that, and that's just one of his really crappy, crappy excuses, because the idea that there's more than one person like Cord Kitty out there is it's pretty depressing. <laughs> All right, that was the last layer. Hopefully you found that interesting and hopefully you've learned a lot about some stuff, some of which you may have wished you didn't learn about. I know I have. If you appreciate the work that went into this or maybe you actually liked it, you weirdo, I'd appreciate it if you liked this video and checked out some of my other also very neat videos. If you super appreciate it, you can always tip me with the super thanks or, or by joining my Patreon or YouTube memberships like Rurum, the artist formerly known as Mouse Bard, also now called Strings of a Mouse, Kit Chimera, Vader's son of Synths fame, Balansk, Ceres, Romu, Linky, Ukulele Otter, and the newest patron, Colorado Blue! <laughs> so thanks to all of them. If you want to join them in the Hall of Fame, then click the join button below the video for early access to my videos up to five days early. Secret Discord access, your name in the credits, special emotes that you can use in the comments, and badges to show how long you've been a member for. Everything is linked in the description. 
Let's read some of the awesome comments you all left, one from each video. From the first video, Layer Zero. Pyrus Air said, To be fair, before friendship is magic, most people that had MLP characters were also considered furries. That's true. The idea of the brony fandom and culture didn't actually become a thing until friendship is magic. And a lot of the people that created uh, brony culture uh, had no idea that really that furry was a thing, even though the community was already essentially furries in it. So there was a lot of staples in the MLP fandom that was just you know, already borrowed from the furry fandom that was in place there, and the bronies built off of it thought they were making something entirely new when they were just further developing what was already there. Pony OCs did exist before FIM, and yeah, they'd be considered furries. Most of the comments are about how I missed warrior cats. I wrote that segment in a different script, and I thought I included it, but I made sure to fix it for this one. In layer one, we have two because they're short. The Blob is very surprised that their art is in the video. I always include fan art at the end of my video, so if you draw something of me, make sure to at me on Twitter, at Proto, or message me, or post it in the fan art channel in my Discord. Olivia said, I'm super interested in this series. It should easily have 10k views. I actually get comments like this a whole heck of a lot, ever since the beginning, really. My channel is pretty new. And it's only been six months since I started making videos and only four months since I started making furry content. YouTube hasn't really found the best place for me yet, and it might be a while before that happens. But if you think I'm underrated, you can help that with liking, commenting, and sharing my videos with other people. If you want to comment, but you don't know what to comment, you can always just put an emoji. Like I uh, told someone else earlier, just put a sheep emoji and a star emoji and bam, right there. For layer two comments, Aza said, New Saravid, keep it up. I'm including this one because Aza is a top commenter, and it's always comments like this. It makes me really happy to see people excited for my videos. We also have Ziggy Zag with, I'd love to go to a panel you host at a furry VR chat furry con. That'd be so cool, smiley face. I'm very open to the idea. I've done videos for people who do panels at uh, real life conventions, and I think it'd be very cool to try. I don't know what I'd do yet, but I don't know much about VR chat or the conventions that are held within. So if anyone has the hookup to get my foot in the door, please let me know. For layer three, we have Aaron. Two minutes, 50 seconds. You haven't lived until you have to tell your wife that you're watching furry prawn for research. I feel like there's a story there. Yes, my wife Mabel is a furry too, so it wasn't that hard to explain. But yeah, each part of these, I have to go in and research them to make sure my memory matches what actually happens. Fox in the Stable was one such topic. It's a pretty lengthy furry prawn animation, and Mabel walks in and she's like, What the hell are you watching? Why are you watching gay furry prawn? <laughs> and I said, It's for business, not pleasure. She understood and left it alone. I wish I was recording it, because it was funny. Layer 4, Flower Face Kitty said, Meow, 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 meow. Cat emoji. I'm going to assume this is a positive comment. If someone else speaks cat and wants to translate that for me, I'd appreciate it. I think she's just commenting for the algorithm. Layer 5. Series talked about not being able to go vegan because they like cheese and eggs too much and honey because I mentioned Rod O'Reilly being a vegan. I used to be a vegan too, so I feel it's my job as a vegan to let everyone know that. Just, I'm, I'm kidding. But uh, yeah, I did used to be a vegan. I did it because... I didn't eat that much meat besides chicken, and I worked at a store where things like vegan cheese were very easy to find. I did it mostly for the animals and the environment. Beef also just doesn't taste that good to me, and most meats actually. Uh, transitioning meds can change a lot, and I don't know if it's that or age, but my palate has really changed, and I kind of just prefer I kind of just prefer vegetables and fungi to meat. I went back to eating meat due to moving, and since I'm in a rural town. The only vegan friendly stores in this town is three times as expensive. Also, my wives eat meat and I cook, so it was harder to avoid. I don't feel like cooking two meals, it already takes me so long to cook one. I'm now what is called a reductarian. Other than holidays, I avoid eating meat and I've pretty much entirely cut beef out of my diet. Unless we get it cheap, like if it's on sale or on clearance. If the beef is on clearance, I feel like it's better that I eat it. Then let that animal then let that animal sacrifice really actually mean nothing because the meat spoils. 
I primarily eat chicken, fish, and very rarely pork. Happy cursed birthday. Uh, okay. Here's a uh, here's one from Flare zero zero eight zero. Happy cursed birthday is Cooper Tom here on YouTube. He has a whole video on it. It he has a whole video on it exploring the space. Both entertaining and informative. It's worth a watch. The video is titled "The True Story Behind a Cursed Image." I put that in the description if I remembered to do it. I did forget to mention that it was Cooper Tom. I did mention higher up in the iceberg, I believe, when I was talking about the politician because the politician did take a picture with Cooper Tom. And I was like, hey, this is Cooper Tom. We see him later in the iceberg. So yeah, uh, the one in the cursed, cursed birthday image, the one on the right is Cooper Tom. All right, and with that, we are at the end. And thank you everybody for watching. And you know what? The year's wrapping up. So let's just talk about how great the year was because who, who cares how long it is at this point? You're all, all right, if you're here, you're really, you're really sold on this whole thing, so. Thank you for all the massive support I've gotten. I've been trying to do YouTube for, well, YouTube slash streaming for about 10 years now. And it really hasn't been working out for me. And I had been trying to do gaming content for so long and it just wasn't working out at all. And gaming content was just a bad choice to do because uh, I'm not particularly good at games. But it's uh, it, it means so much to have so many of y'all so quickly i don't think a lot of you like i i know i say this a lot but i don't think people realize that 2000 well almost 2500 subs in just six months is like ridiculous numbers most youtube channels don't get a thousand subs in their first year and i got it after three months <laughs> so that's a uh, that's just pretty crazy to me it took me a lot longer to get the watch time, honestly. I needed 4K watch time for monetization. But that I got the subs before the monetization means that it took very little content for you all to see that you wanted to stick around. So, thank you for sticking around. And I look forward to seeing y'all for the entire next year, too. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And I'll see you all later. Bye! Bye!